The Prophecy Club, a nationwide television program, a nationwide radio program. The Prophecy Club also hosts approximately 40 major city meetings per month. is to inform Christians of current events that confirm Bible prophecy, expose the evil devices of Satan, warn believers what is coming to America, challenge people to stop sinning and turn to Jesus with all their heart, and to provide a platform for Christian speakers to be heard. It's a bald-faced lie. Using the positions of power and authority in our own government. The greatest oil field in the world is at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. He said, son, you must warn this nation. And now your host for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson. Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Now, our Bible tells us that we are not supposed to be ignorant of the devices of the devil. And you're about to get a lot of information on the devices of the devil tonight because your speaker is an ex-Satanist high priest. He's going to expose the subtle devices used to lure people into witchcraft and into Satanism. And he says he can get a box about this big and he can walk through the average Christian's home and he will be able to fill that box up with occult and satanic things in your home that have been placed there that you didn't realize were satanic and occultic. He's going to give you his opinion about the evil behind things like Ouija boards, tarot cards, psychics, movies, video games, Teletubbies, and Pokemon. You're going to discover the evil behind the symbols that you see Every day, will you help me welcome Stephen Dollins? Thank you. Can anybody hear me? Good. I, uh, I lead praise and worship at our church back in Topeka, Kansas, and I've been told if the microphone ever went out, you can still hear me sing. I don't know if that's good or not, but I'm just happy to be here. And I'm really happy to see everybody here because uh, that means I'm alive and well and my feet are back on the ground. I've flown so much in the last two months, I think they've got a plane probably with my name on it. But <laughs> praise God. All right. How many here are excited to be with the Lord tonight? Amen. No, 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 no. How many here are excited to be with the Lord tonight? Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, most of the time when people in the occult, whatever facet of the occult they're in, whether it's witchcraft, Satanism, any of those facets, they try to justify it by saying that, well, it's okay because I'm not hurting anybody. In other words, I read people's palms and that's not hurting anybody. I look into people's uh, tarot cards, but I'm not hurting anybody. And I read crystal balls, but that's not hurting anybody either. Well, the truth of it is, is yes, it is. Because the first person is hurting is you. You're very important to the Lord. The second person is hurting is the person you're putting those spells on. Because if you think that you're putting spells on, pers on, on people and hexes on people aren't hurting them, you got another thing coming. I hope everybody brought their, their sword with them tonight. Because if you didn't, I'll, I'll give you a little, little uh, word of wisdom here. Never go anywhere without your sword because you don't know what kind of dragons you may have to slay. And so it doesn't make any difference what I have to say about it. It's what God has to say about it. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, and we're going to see what the Lord has to say about it. Deuteronomy 18, and we're going to start with verse 9. Now, you need to understand that when God uses the word abomination, that is the closest word to hatred that you will find him use in Scripture. In other words, he detests that thing with his whole heart, almost to the point to where he can't even look on it. You see, God doesn't hate the sinner, he hates the sin. When I was blaspheming God and calling up demon spirits in a, in a magic circle, he didn't hate me. He hated the sin that I was doing. He hated the sin of Satanism. So we're going to see what the Lord says are abominations to him. We're going to start with verse 9. It says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination, there's that word, of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That's human sacrifice. 
or that useth divination. What's divination? Fortune telling. You're looking into crystal balls, you're, you're operating a Ouija board, you're having your tarot cards read, or you're calling 1-900-SIN hotline. Notice I didn't say psychic hotline, it's a SIN hotline. And we'll talk about that later as, as to how that works. And then he says, or an observer of times. What's that? Astrology. Charting your destiny on the planets, the stars, the sun, the solar system. And then he goes on to say, or an enchanter. Now when you think of the word chant, you think of something that's said over and over again. In other words, it's something is spoken. But it doesn't have to be just spoken. How many know that your kids are usually bombarded by about 6,000 to 8,000 subliminal messages on those occult cartoons they turn, every, they turn to every Saturday morning? If you were to take a videotape and tape that whole Saturday morning program of those cartoons and run it back in slow motion later on, you'd see them, guaranteed. And also, an enchanter is someone who enchants you into doing something. In other words, they, they make it look real sweet to the point to where, you know, you just kind of lull you into it and, and, and kind of pull you into it by just saying, come on over here and taste this. And then by the time you've got it tasted, you get hungrier and hungrier and to the point to where you've eaten so much, now you're into it, you can't get out of it. And then he goes on to say, or a witch. Now, a witch is traditionally, primarily, and exclusively a female practitioner of the old craft. Let me say that again. A witch is primarily, traditionally, and exclusively a female practitioner of the old craft. Very rarely are males even allowed into a witchcraft coven to even watch their, their activities. Then he goes on to say, or a charmer. Now, what's a charmer? Well, a lot of you ladies are sitting next to one. Amen? <laughs> so, he goes on to say a charmer. <clears throat> now, charmer can be something that kind of lulls you into it, and just it's almost like candy. Like, a, like you know, we all know how Satan just kind of throws things out there like candy, and then just, you know, here's a little bit, and it tastes good, and it tastes sweet. Keep coming for more, and you keep coming for more until a point to where you can't turn around and walk away from it. Ch a charm can also be a symbol or a piece of jewelry. I'm going to show you some of those symbols tonight. Some of you ladies may have even been wearing it. Praise God, now you can get rid of it. And then he goes on to say, or a consulter with familiar spirits. What is a familiar spirit? Familiar spirit is a demon entity that is familiar with you intimately. When you are born again, in other words, when, when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, God puts you on a road and puts you on a path for you to walk. You are now assigned by Satan himself at least two, more than often than that, it's more than that, but at least two demonic spirits to be around you 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year with one assignment. You know what that is? Get you off of that walk that God just put you on. And they do, they do an excellent job of it in a lot of people. Let me give you an example person that's been in alcoholism, comes home uh, intoxicated every night, sometimes even gets through the door and he, can, he falls down, or he gets in the door and he, he can't wait to get to where he can beat his, his, his uh, wife or his child, gets delivered of that. And now he says, I've been delivered of alcoholism. And he walks out in freedom. Now, guess who the first people he's going to meet? Old drinking buddies. That's not by coincidence. The other thing is, let's say you've got a, a person that's in drugs and they've been shooting stuff in their veins for years. In fact, to the point to where their, their veins are almost collapsing. And he says, I've been delivered of drugs. Nope. Walks out the door and guess who the people he's going to run into? People he used to get high with, maybe even the drug dealers. That's their assignment is to put those people in your path so that he keeps continually throws you off the road that God puts you on. Now you know why you as a, as a Christian, you sit there and you go, Lord, I just don't understand. I'm having all these battles in my life and I'm supposed to be, you know, I'm supposed to be a child of yours and, and I'm just continually battling this and that. It's because those spirits have been assigned to you. Look into the scripture where Paul said, I was given a messenger. I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. What did Paul do before he became a Christian? 
he tormented and killed God's people. So that messenger was sent to him to tell him day in and day out, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, how can you serve God when you used to kill his people? That's how that works. Then he goes on, oh, by the way, let me say this. These are the spirits that you contact when you're trying to contact the spirit of Uncle Tom or Aunt Clara that have passed on into the Never Never world. Okay, let's see, well, let's see what God's word says. Let's, it says, it is appointed for one man to die, and after that, you just keep coming back. Is that right? Okay, well, it is appointed once for man to die, and after that, you just continue to roam around as a spirit. No? It says what? Judgment. Judgment. Oh, so there is no coming back. Gee, then who are we contacting? When their eyes roll up in their head and they're supposed to be talking, you know, it amazes me when, when these people that go to these seances and that's where you have a medium where uh, the, this person is supposed to be a contact, in contact with this never, never world. And one of the spirits from some, uh, one of your family members have passed on into this world and you try to contact them. And it amazes me because then all of a sudden, you know, only Bill would have known that. It's amazing. Nope. The spirits that were around Bill that are familiar with him intimately knew that too. See, that's how psychic hotline works. I call it sin hotline. It's not a psychic hotline. If you look at the, the track record of psychics, it's terrible. You know, in the Old Testament, if you were a true prophet and you were given true knowledge, and you were only 99% correct, you were stoned. You were stoned to death. But yet here we have 1-900 numbers, and it amazes me. You know, I used to watch on TV, they called the 1-900, and you could have your... Uh, horoscope. I call them horoscopes, not horoscope. But you used to be able to read your horoscope and, and they would tell you what, what is in the stars for you, planted in the stars for you. And now, praise God, you can call 1-900 number and get your tarot cards read over the phone. Isn't that amazing? And you know what really gets to me is that the testimonies that they give in these programs are mostly women. And do you know what they say? Oh, my psychic told me where to find my boyfriend, who he was with, and what they were doing. And wasn't that amazing? No. Who was in sin first? The psychic. She was in an abomination to the Lord. We just read that. The second person that was in sin was the boyfriend, straying away from the relationship. So now you have a demon that's around that boyfriend or possessing that boyfriend, influencing that boyfriend to do that act of sin, and now that demon is communicating back to the demon that's in the psychic. It's a demon hotline. Yes. Not a psychic hotline. You have two demons communicating back with each other what the other person is doing. That's how that works. And then he goes on to say, or a wizard. A wizard is a male practitioner of the black arts. Black magic. Also referred to as a warlock. So a witch is primarily and traditionally and exclusively a female. A wizard is a male practitioner, also referred to as warlock. And then he goes on to say, or a necromancer. Now, the necromancer is one who summons the spirits back from the dead, supposedly. And they're the ones where their eyes roll up in their head, and all of a sudden you hear the voice of one of your, one of your dear loved ones that passed by and passed into the Never Never Land. You know, these spirits are so intimately familiar with them that now they can imitate them to the T. I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to distinguish that the person that you're talking to is really not the person that passed away. And then he goes on to say, and this is God, For all that do these things are, there's that word, an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. I don't know about you, but I love the word of God. I love the Word of God, because I'm telling you, when God reveals the truth, it's like one of those paper shades when you pull it down, you know, and all of a sudden you just kind of let it go, and it whoa, comes back up. You see a lot of eyes get opened up. And I'll tell you what, you can compromise with a lie, but you can't argue with the truth. And when God reveals the truth to you, I mean, it's almost like eyes just light up, and you see that. When, uh, when I was born, I never knew my blood parents. My blood parents, uh, the only thing I knew about my blood parents was that my father was a policeman, my mother was a nurse. And I'm not going to tell you my age, but I was born in the 50s, okay, back in the late 50s. 
And at that time, it was very easy to adopt a child. You didn't have to go through all the paperwork and things that you go through now. It was very easy. All you had to do was know the doctor, and then the doctor would communicate with the hospital. And then, you know, if, if you'd already had your name in on this list, I mean, that's the, you got a baby. And my parents, bless, bless their heart, I mean, I got, I got adopted into a family that, I mean, it was, it was definitely God's work doing it. Um, my father, which was the world to me, um, he was professor of psychology and the head of the education department at Northwestern Oklahoma State University. And uh, my mother, she had also been a teacher also. But the Lord showed me on down through the times after I got saved that, and by the way, I got saved on February 2nd, 1978. The Lord showed me after that that there must have been some generational witchcraft in my family. The reason I say that is, is as a child, I had a regular normal childhood except for one thing. And that was that I was able to make things happen to children that I wanted them to happen to them. Not big things, you know, just small things like kids falling off their bicycle or falling down, scraping their knees. But it was when I wanted it to happen. I thought it was cool. I thought it was a gift. And I just played along with it. And, you know, it, all the way down through as I was growing up, I got fascinated with magic and the occult and with the, with the art of witchcraft. Used to love the Wizard of Oz. Used to love the sit. I, I watched that thing every time it was on TV. And when I, was a, when I was smaller, I used to love horror movies. And I know most there are some people out there that do st still too, but I used to love horror movies. And my favorite one was Frankenstein, the werewolf, and Dracula. And the werewolf scared me to death. I mean, I was a little tyke. I had no hair on my body, but if I had it, it had been standing up, you know, by the time I got that. And I was one of those kids that, I mean, I loved to watch that thing at night and then click off the TV and hope to be in bed before the light and the TV went off. You know, and then you pull the covers up over your head and you just kind of barely breathe because you want to hear if there's anything outside the covers. You know, it was just a thrill. See, our kids love to be scared. You know, they'll tell you they don't, but they do. It's a rush. It's a rush. That's why people love it. Love it. That's why a lot of people go to those haunted houses, those so-called haunted houses that they set up on uh, Halloween, you know, put on by people like the good people like the JCs and things like that. That's, right. That's why they go. It's that rush. They love to be scared. And I used to love to watch those things and get really fascinated with those. And the more I started watching those, the more I got interested in witchcraft. And I started watching more and more shows on witchcraft and witches and, you know, things of the occult. And when I got to be a freshman in college, I went to the same college that my dad taught at. And I never do that. Never do that. Because invariably you end up in their class and they use you for an example. Okay. Okay. My son there, you know, just <laughs> one of those kind of things. And when I got in as a freshman in college, I decided that what I wanted to do is I wanted to follow in my father's footsteps. And I wanted to be a teacher, too. And I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to teach either elementary level or high school level speech and English. And so that's what I set out to do. And I, on the, our, my freshman year, at the end of my freshman semester, we were given an assignment. We had five months to do this in. And we were supposed to, first of all, write an essay for English. And that's how you got your English grade. And then you were supposed to give that essay as a speech for your speech class, and that's how you got your speech uh, grade. And so I said, what am I going to do this on? What in the world am I going to write on? I know I'll prove that witchcraft and magic don't work. Because, you see, I'd watched this on TV to the point to where I was con convinced that it was just on TV. You know, witches are just on TV. The good witch, the bad witch, they don't, they don't exist. And so I set out to prove that, that it didn't exist. And I did that in a small town in Oklahoma who has only one small library and a bookstore downtown. And the bookstore is a, actually the drugstore. So I went in there, and I went to the library, and I started looking for all kinds of books on witchcraft. Couldn't find them. How many know you can't find them because the witches get in there and steal them out of there? So you can't get a hold of their material. Same thing the Masonic Lodge does. Send the Masons in there, steal the books out of there, so you can't find out what they believe. So I said, well, I'll go over to the drugstore. Now, Alva, the, the town I came from, is a very small town. And I mean, it's one of those towns where everybody knows everybody. And everybody knows everybody else's business. And so I walked into that drugstore, and I, I real calmly said, do you have any books on witchcraft? He said, what? 
I said, do you have any books on witchcraft? He looked at me and said, do I need to call your mother? I said, no. So I had nixed that idea, and I got out of there real quick. And I said, well, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to write in these magazines, and I'm going to have to send off for these occult books. You know, in the back of those, uh, some of those magazines you can send off, and, the, and you send in 10 or $15 or whatever it is, and they mail you a book. And I got about 20 of them, and I read them from cover to cover. And I thought, hey, I've got a lot of information right here. Then I thought, you know, if, if I'm going to give up there, I, this, is, this is good for the essay, but if I'm going to give up there and give a speech on this, I better be able to say that I know for a fact that it doesn't work because I met some people that claim to be witches, and I watched them, and nothing happened. So I said, okay, now I know what I have to do. I have to find a witch. Now, you know what it's like to walk on a college campus, and you walk up to somebody and go, hey, are you a witch? You know? <laughs> we had some there, but you know, <laughs> and we, I passed on down and, and, and I was, I was in the student center one day and I played in a, in a, in a rock and roll band at that time. I, I played in rock and roll band since I was 13 years old. Uh, I, I recorded like three CDs with different groups. They never went anywhere except on my wall, you know, where I could look around and go, Hey, I did that, you know, but one of those and, and I was at the time I was playing with a heavy metal band there at the college and, and the drummer was from the East Coast and we were sitting in the student center one day and I had my hand in, in my hands and I I looked pretty depressed and he looked over at me and he said what's the matter and I said I don't know man I said I've got to find I've got to find information on this stuff I've got several months to do this essay and then I've got to give it as a speech and I can't find any information he said what are you doing it on I said I'm setting out to prove that witchcraft and the occult don't work he said, are you sure about that? I said, well, yeah, I'm fairly sure. I mean, I haven't seen anything. I've been watching people, but I, I can't see anything. He said, I think I can help you out. And I said, how's that? I could introduce you to a couple. Oh, are they witches? No, but they know people. I said, cool. I'll be waiting. Sure enough, he introduced me to Kenny and Christy. Now, Kenny, i explain it to you. Kenny looks like somebody left over from the hippie days. I mean, he had the real long, scraggly hair and the unkept beard, and his eyes were glazed because he was on pot 24 hours a day. And his beautiful wife, Christy, who was a, a, a nice blonde flower child, I mean, she had the nice long dress and the sandals, and she had, you know, beads on her wrist and beads around her. Well, she was beady, you know. And so I, I, I got introduced to them, and I loved them. I loved them. I loved going over there to their house because Kenny and Christy are the first ones to introduce me to mescaline, LSD, belladonna, hashish, marijuana. I mean, everything that you wanted, it was right there. And you used to love to go over there and get high and sit in front of his stereo and listen to all these, these rock and roll records. And I was having so much fun that I almost forgot why I was there in the first place. And finally, I looked over at him and I said, I think I, I heard that you can help me out. And he said, what's that? And I said, I have got to find somebody that claims to be a witch. I mean, I don't care what it takes. I've got to find this person and talk to him and get information from him. He said, well, just a minute. He said, where did you, who, who referred you to me? And I said, Dave, the drummer. He went in and called Dave just so he could confer that actually Dave did refer me. And he said, okay. He said, just a minute. And he went back in and he made another phone call. And 15 minutes later, he walked back in the room and said, it's all set. And I said, what's all set? He said, you're going to be asked to come to a meeting. You're going to receive a phone call. He said, you be ready to go when that phone call comes. Don't call me to try to find out when they're going to call. I don't know. But when they call, you better be ready to go. I said, okay. I waited for a month for that call. And it came on a Thursday night. I had a big test Friday morning. Dad had just told me, you know, better get to bed, son. You know, you got a big test tomorrow. And I said, yeah, Dad, I'm going. Quarter 12, the phone rang, got up and answered it. Lady on the other end identified herself as a woman named Alexandria, said she was a priestess of a coven. She said, here's the address, here's how to get there, come now. I'm looking at my watch and I'm sitting there, it's almost 12, it's almost midnight. She said, uh, we know, come now. And if you don't come now, you won't get another call. You won't hear from us again. I said, well, I got to get this information. So I hollered in at dad and I said, dad, I said, I've got a, a good friend that's in trouble. Just broke up with his girlfriend and he's, you know, talking uh, crazy and stuff. And I got to go over there and talk to him. And dad said, okay, but be back early. <laughs> yeah, right. So I went over there 
And I walked into this apartment, and here was Alexandria. I identified herself. She, she introduced herself, and she said she was glad to meet me. And I walked in, and I noticed that it was just a regular apartment, except that most of the women there were nude and semi-nude, and they were all sitting around in this white circle painted on the floor. And inside that circle was a, a five-pointed star. And on the candles lit at each point of that star. And they were inside that thing, and they were, they were singing, and they were chanting, and they were humming. And, you know, I had no idea what the song was. I started humming along, so I didn't look out of place. You know, and they said, now what we're going to do, we're going to sit you inside that circle. And don't get out of there. And we're going to send people back to you one at a time. And you ask them anything you want to ask them. But we sit you in that circle, don't get out. And I said, why is that? She said, because we've been charging the air with all of the spirits, and we've been really summoning up our deities, and you're an outsider. And if you get outside that circle, you may be subject to attack from whatever's still left over. I said, don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. So I got in there, and I sat down, and sure enough, they came back one at a time, and they sat in front of a candle, and I asked them everything I wanted to ask them. How do you cast a hex? How do you make a love potion? How do you do a love spell? How do you summon spirits? And by the time I got done, which was 4 o'clock the next morning, I left there and I had a big notebook. And I, I knew then I was ready. So I got back to the house and I started reading through all the things that I'd been told. And I said, okay, I said, this is really great. But if I'm going to give a speech on this, I'm going to have to say that I actually tried these things and I know for a fact that they don't work. So I got my friends together and we, we started doing things out of there. All the things that they had told me, hexes, love spells, curses, Everything we could think of. And you know what? Every last one of them worked. So then I'm thinking, hey, maybe I better change over a little bit here instead of proving that it doesn't work. Maybe I better set out to prove that it does work because I've already seen it. I gave my essay and I gave my speech, got an A-plus on it, walked outside the classroom. Two girls were waiting for me outside. I said, we've been watching you. We know that you have inborn powers. Now, I had no idea because I had never said anything to anybody about my childhood. Said, so we know you have inborn powers. We can take those powers. We can generate them and make you into what we think is your destiny. I said, what's that? And she said, just come to this meeting. We're going to have a meeting next Friday night, midnight. You come. I said, okay. They gave me the address, wrote down the address, told me how to get there, a little map. And sure enough, on that Friday night, I drove over there, and I, it, it's in the Risty district of our city. And, you know, come from a lower middle class, you don't go up in the Risty district, you know, you don't even have any business up there. But we were driving around up in there, and, and all of a sudden, I, I turned the corner, and I, I recognized the house, and it was my old high school biology teacher. And I pulled up in the driveway, and I got out, and I went up to the door, and I thought, man, I've got the wrong house. Knocked on the door, and, he, you know, I was shocked when he answered the door. And he was dressed in a black robe, holding a black candle. And he, entered, he, he said, I'm glad to meet you, Stephen. He said, come on in. We've been expecting you. And sure enough, my old high school biology teacher came out from the back. And I said, you too? He said, yes. And now I was looking for the circle on the floor. So you can imagine I was pretty relieved when I didn't see any circles, you know, painted on the floor. And people were dressed. So I felt pretty much comfortable. The only difference was that on the wall, on his wall, on the right-hand side, was a black cross hanging upside down. And then as you go back to the halls, on each side of the walls, there were pictures depicting of, uh, pictures of hell, like demons casting people off into, into hell flames with, with uh, pitchforks, things like that. And I looked at him and I said, you're a devil worshiper? And he said, yes. He said, we know where the true power is. And I said, oh. And so he said, I want to introduce you to someone. Man came out of the back. He was about six foot two, thin, had a hood on his head, still in a black robe, carrying another black candle. He walked out and introduced himself as Michael. And Michael said, glad to meet you. He said, we're very interested in you. He said, we've been watching you very carefully. In fact, we know things about you that you don't think we know. Now, that made me feel real comfortable. Then he looked at me and he said, we think you just may be the new blood we're looking for. Now, I want to tell you something. You're in a group of people that are holding black candles. They're dressed in black robes. And you know they worship the devil. And they look at you and tell you that you're the new blood they're looking for. First thing that goes through your mind is, oh, my God, they want to sacrifice me. 
But that wasn't the case. And he must have read my mind because he said, no, that's not, the, that's not it. He said, our, our leader is going back to a grotto. Grotto, by the way, in, in witchcraft, you have covens. And that's 13 young women. It could be older women. But 13 women, then you have a high priestess that rules over them. In Satanism, you have what's called grottos, and there are no certain number of men or women. It's just all mixed. Then you have a high priest and a high priestess that rules over them. And he said he was going back to take over a grotto on the West Coast, and they needed somebody to fill his place. And they thought I was the one that might be just in position for that. And he said, what we want you to do is we want you to continue to come to meetings. And so I did for the next six months. And my high school biology teacher became my mentor, taught me everything I needed to know. And by the, that time, I was really getting really into this. And I mean, the people made me feel so comfortable and so welcome. And so, I mean, they're just like their hands and their arms were open. And you'd look over on a table and there'd be lines of cocaine and there'd be mescaline and there'd be heroin. I mean, everything that you could imagine would be on this table. And they said, if that's what you want, there it is. And they looked over here and they said, there was a line of women sitting on a couch. And they said, if that's what you're into, he said, all you got to do is point out that woman. We'll send them back in the back. Well, being around Satanists, I didn't want to get high. And I'm real shy around women. So that didn't really, <laughs> you know, that didn't really appeal to me. So I said, no, I'll just, I'll just stand around and watch, see what you guys do. And so I did. And I got picked up everything that they needed to tell me. And then one night they started talking about something about sacrifice. And I looked at them and I thought, no, nah, I don't know about this. Because, see, I, I, I went to, well, I was dragged to Sunday school, okay, as a child. I was one of those children that when they get out of the car, you see like two tracks go from the car all the way up to the porch of the church because they're trying to dig their heels into the ground, keep mom from pulling them along. And I knew about Jesus because I'd studied in Sunday school about Jesus and the little lambs and Jesus and the children and that sort of thing. But I didn't know who he was. I didn't know what he did. And at that time, I didn't know he did it for me. And so something inside said, no, these, these people are, are just not for you. And I turned around to walk away. This was the last part of 69. Turned around to walk away. And I'll never forget, he put his hand on my shoulder. Michael put his hand on my shoulder, turned me around. And with cold black eyes, he said, you'll be back. I said, I don't think so. September 1970, I was working on, uh, after classes, I'd go over and work on stage sets for, for college plays. And I was up on the scaffold and I was putting up lighting for a play getting ready, they were getting ready to put on that weekend. And a, a young man came running through the door and he said, hey, did you just hear the news? He said, some old man just got killed, hit and run. And I hollered down, I said, what? He said, yeah, I was just on the radio. He said, some old man was on his bicycle and a guy hit him with a car and, and it hit and run. They, they can't find him. They can't catch him. And now the first thing that went to my mind was, well, he deserved it. You know, I mean, some old man on a bicycle, he didn't need to be out there in the first place. Now, it never dawned on me that my dad, to relax after class, used to like to take his bicycle and the bird dogs and ride about a half a mile outside of town where he had friends that had a farm and they had a vegetable garden, and that's what he loved to do after class, to relax. And about five minutes later, I got a page, and it was one of Dad's good friends. And he says, we think you better come home because we think it's your dad. We can't find the bird dogs and his bicycle's gone. Did you hear the news? And I said, yes, I did. He said, you better come home. We're just waiting for identification. So I got in my car and I hurried home. When I got to the house, all the friends of the family and, and, and neighbors were all right around the house. and. One of dad's very, very good friends came up and gave me a big hug. And he said, we're praying it's not Joe, but we, we think it's your dad. We're just waiting. And sure enough, within five minutes, the highway patrol called back and identified positively that it was my dad that had been killed. The man that, that killed him and hit and run, he had just been released from a mental institution. He was coming back from seeing his lawyer on a sodomy case. He was drunk and going over 100 miles an hour, came off a bridge and hit my dad from behind as he was riding on a bicycle. Killed him instantly. After the funeral... Good, good meaning people, all they could tell me was that it must have been God's will. God must have needed your dad for something really bad. God must have had something special in heaven. And you know what? That didn't comfort me. That made me extremely angry. And I said, if that's the kind of God that would take my dad off the earth like that, I don't want to have anything to do with him. And I turned around and announced that I was giving up any kind of church, you know, affiliation that I didn't believe in, in that God. And I said, I know where the true power is. And I went back to those people and told them now I was ready to join. 
I had to fill out an application, they told me, send it in to the Church of Satan in San Francisco, California. That's who this group was associated with, run by a man named Anton Zandor LeVay. This application is worse than a tax form. I mean, it's about 25, 30 pages, and they want to know everything about you. And I mean everything, even including your sexual preferences. You send this thing in, and they tell you to wait four to six weeks, and they give you a, a reply back as to whether or not you've been accepted or rejected from the church. I said, well, I'll just wait the four to six weeks. Mother decided that at the end of that week, we needed to go to Clarksville, Texas, to visit my grandmother to get away from all this, to have a little break. Funeral was already over. We needed to relax. And I said, okay. We got in the car and drove all the way down to the southern panhandle of Texas to a little town called Clarksville. Now, in Clarksville, the, the, about the biggest excitement is their movie theater. Okay, that's where everybody spends their time. And they have one movie theater, and they have just a small bookstore on the corner. And I went down there, and I said, well, I'm going to get out of here. I've heard all these people talking about Dad and how sad it is that he's gone, and this, I've, I've got to get some air. So I went in the car, and I went downtown, and I went to the movie theater, and sure enough, it was a movie I'd seen about two or three times, so I decided I didn't want to go there. I said, I know, I'll get something to read. I went over to the little bookstore. And I went over to the bookstore, and I walked in there, and I, you know, big selection. It was one of, those, one of those round racks that you turn around, carousel racks. And I turned it around the first time, and there was nothing there but love stories and war stories and westerns. And I turned it around the second time and looked in every book in the rack, and there was love stories and war stories and westerns. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is going to be exciting. And I turned around the third time, and there was love stories and war stories. Staring at me was a black book, and it was the Satanic Bible by Anton Zandor LeVay that hadn't been there the first two times I turned that rack around. I went up there and I said, do you have any more of these? The clerk said, we didn't even know we had that one. What is it? I said, never mind. Sell it to me. I think I paid about $5 for it. Took it home, read it from cover to cover, even started trying to memorize things out of it. Went back and shared it with my girlfriend at the time. She said, oh, this is great because this is the way that I've believed all along. I said, well, cool. When I get to be a high priest, I'll bring you in and make you the high priestess. And she said, well, that'd be good. So when I got back to, to Alva, sure enough, not a week had passed. There was a church uh, letter in the mailbox, a reply from them. Not only had I been accepted into the church, I had also, through the referral of Michael and his group, been given the honor of being high priest. And that's what I did for the next seven and a half years. I led those people in Oklahoma. And I mean, we did everything. We, we, we summoned up demonic spirits to go out and do what we wanted them to do. You see, Satan in Satanism, the Satanists don't actually do anything. You summon up the spirits to go out and do it for you. I got to tell you a story. I got to tell, tell you this, because if, if you're born again Christian, you're spirit filled. I mean, you need to know how powerful the name of Jesus is. You do, you do. You need to know about the blood of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we summoned up a spirit, and the reason we did that is one of the one night, one of the witches came in, one of the young witches came in, and she said, there's a lady down the street who's a Christian, and she's, she's threatening to expose us, threatening to expose our group. And I said, well, we've got the police department, the sheriff's department. I mean, there's no problem there. She goes, no, you don't understand. She's going to tell my mother. I said, oh, we can't have that. She said, no. She tells my mother, she said, my mother will make me quit. I said, oh, okay. Well, what do you want us to do? Well, let's just hurt her a little bit. Let's put a hex on her. Not a big one, just a little one. I said, oh, you mean send something after her just to make something happen to let her know we're there? She said, yes. Okay, we can do that. So what we did is we got in the circle and we summoned up a spirit named Astaroth. Now, this is supposed to be one of the hierarchy of the demons. And over in the side of the room, this orange cloud started appearing. And as it appeared, there started appearing a face out of that cloud. And guess what face it was? The wolf man. The thing that I'd been afraid of ever since I was a little kid. So I'm sitting there trying to make people think that, hey, I'm cool. You know, nothing wrong with me. I didn't want to show fear in front of my people, you know, <laughs> my followers. And so all of a sudden, this, this cloud started appearing, and we told it what we wanted it to do. We sent it off, and it was gone. 
We came out, five minutes later, came out of the circle, everybody talking, having a good time. We were getting ready to break the meeting up. All of a sudden, this orange cloud started appearing in the side of the room again. And I looked at it and I said, oh, everybody back in the circle, quick. And we got back in the circle and this, cl this cloud appeared again. This time, this thing was in a rage. I mean, it was angry. And it spoke to me just like I'm speaking to you tonight. I mean that audibly. And it said, don't you ever send me after a Christian again. And I'm telling you, I mean, that's, that's the power. This, this woman must have had the blood of Jesus all over her. Oh, hallelujah. You know, must have had the blood of Jesus all over her. Must have even, even anointed her house or had protective angels outside or something, you know. I think that was probably my biggest turning point. Because I'm sitting there now thinking, wait a minute. We're supposed to be the ones in control. We're supposed to have all the power. And all of a sudden, here's a demon spirit telling us, don't send it after Christians. What's going on? Anyway, one thing led to another. I ended up being, uh, my mother actually ended up shipping me to, to Topeka, Kansas to live with my aunt and uncle because she thought that they could make me prim and proper and shape me up. And they tried. And I rebelled every step of the way. I was practicing things on my own even while living at their house. Praise God, my aunt and I have such a, a relationship now because, I mean, I look at her as being my second mother. She's done so much for me. But... I rebelled, and I regret that, but I rebelled every step of the way. And then I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and marry the high priestess, so I'll have a reason to get out of here. You know, it's, it's, it's no fun to practice on your own. You need somebody to practice with. So I married her, brought her up to Topeka. We moved out, got our own apartment. We practiced on our own, never really got into a group again, but we kind of just kept continuing to practice. And... One thing led to another, and at one point, I mean, all my jobs were, were falling in, caving in. It was like I couldn't keep a job, and I said, what's going on here? And our house was about to be, the mortgage on it was about to be foreclosed. We were penniless. We were broke. I mean, we, we had nothing. And one, one morning, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I just decided that my wife had gone to bed, and I was sitting there in a chair, and I said, this is it. It's over. And I took out a gun. And I looked at it, and it had two bullets in the chamber, and I said, one of them will get. And I put it to my head, and I said, this is it. I'm going to glorify myself. Now, you need to understand, there are three denominations of Satanism. The first denomination believes that if you're a good Satanist, and you followed what he told you to do, that when you die, you get to be reborn in someone else and live your life all over again. It's like something else. The second denomination believes that if you were a good Satanist when you die, hell is not a place where you go and you are burn in torment. It's whatever life, whatever sin in the flesh you enjoyed in this life, you get to enjoy it a thousand times more whenever you get there. Okay? And the third denomination, which was the denomination that I was a member of, believed that the Battle of Armageddon, Satan was finally going to overthrow God, take his place on the throne. And if you were a good Satanist, you got to reign along with him. They're still waiting for that. Okay? And so I, I said, well, I'm going to glorify myself. I'm going to take myself out, and I'll be honored whenever I get there. And so I had the gun, and, and I was getting ready to, to put it to my head, and, and flashbacks started coming back. And I had a, a, a friend that I worked on night shift for about three years. I worked at a, a facility there in, in Topeka and for mentally retarded children. And I worked on a night shift with him for three years. And he had given me a book called The Satan Seller by Mike Warnke. And I read that book in two nights. I mean, I said, I couldn't put it down. I sat there and I read that book for two nights. And I thought, you know, all hell seems to be breaking loose in my life. But this guy got out. Now, I'm not going to become a Christian like he did. I said, but maybe at least I can get out of it. You see, Satan has a lie for everybody that's in the occult. And that is that once you're in, you can't get out. And so... I read that book, and I, I started getting a little more hope, and even the friend that gave it to me had been in a group called the Brotherhood in Southern California, and they were really heavily into uh, animal sacrifice, human sacrifice, and even the abduction of children. And he had gotten out through a group called Christ is the Answer as they were passing through Topeka one summer. And so I talked to him, and, I, and, and that night, or that morning, I said, I'm just going to call him and thank him for being my friend, because he was the only person that ever really tried to reach out to me. And I called him on the phone. The first time I couldn't get him, something told me to let the phone keep ringing. Sure enough, he picked the phone up. I said, I'm just getting ready to take myself out of this world, and I just wanted to thank you for being my friend. And I said, but you know, it's real strange. I feel like there's an invisible hand reaching out to me, and this is my last chance. He said, what is, I said, what is it? 
He said, brother, you don't know how right you are. He started crying on the other end. He said, people have been praying for you for the last seven years. In fact, while you were downstairs in your mother's house with your group of people summoning up demons, your mother was probably in her bedroom on her very knees praying for your soul. I said, huh. He said, does our friendship ever mean anything to you? And I said, oh, yeah, it's been the world. I mean, you've been my only friend. He said, then do me one favor. Put the gun down tonight. Don't do anything. I'm going to make a phone call. I'm going to set up a meeting for tomorrow morning. I've got two friends. I said, what kind of friends? Well, they're Christian ministers. As soon as he said the word Christian, I said, no, nah, I'm not going to talk to any Christians. He goes, no, I don't expect you to convert or anything else. He said, just promise me you'll at least talk to him. I said, okay, I'll talk to him. I put down the gun that night, and I couldn't even sleep that night because I kept hearing audible voices telling me, don't listen to him. Pick up that gun and glorify yourself. You'll be honored when you get here. But because of his sake and because of my love for him, I put the gun down, didn't do anything. Sure enough, and then I thought, you know, I'm still going to take myself out, but before I go, I'm going to do something that's even going to glorify my master, Satan, and I'm going to walk into that, that church tomorrow, and I'm going to take those two Christian ministers, I'm going to make them doubt what they believe, I'm going to turn them around from what they believe and convert them over into what I believe. And that's what I thought. So I walked into that church, I mean, and, and before, he picked me up. You ever seen Hulk Hogan when he pumps up on, on TV? I mean, that's, I was pumped. I had my satanic Bible marked. I mean, you know, it looked like one of those highlighted Bibles that people have where you can read them miles away. I mean, I, I had everything because I knew they were going to use scripture on me and I was going to be ready, you know. And I walked into that church and I mean, I was, the walls were up. The first minister walked over and he gave me a big hug and I said, I'm not going to hug him back. The second one walked over and he took my hand, he shook it, and he looked at me with these eyes and he said, praise God, brother. And he says, I love you so much. And he said, God loves you so much. Do you realize how much love you've missed out on in the last seven and a half years? Now, if he had said anything else, I was ready. But when he said that, it was like, because <laughs> I'd forgotten what that was. And he showed me through a book. Now, if you ever get a chance to get a copy of this book, you need to pick it up. I guarantee it will bless your life. It's called The Three Wills of God by Leslie Weatherhead. The Three Wills of God by Leslie Weatherhead. And in this book, now follow with me, in this book, it says that God has three basic wills. First one is his intentional will. In other words, you're born for a purpose, he puts you on a path, and that's what he intends for you to do the rest of your life. Okay? The second will is the circumstantial will, which means in the flesh, I have the choice to step off of that road and say, I'm going over here for a while, or I'm going over here for a while, and I'll get back on that road later on. Or circumstances, whether they be outside forces or whatever, temporarily come along and throw you off of that road. But that God has his third will, and his third will is his ultimate will. Which means that no matter what you do in the flesh, no matter what the circumstances are, you're ultimately going to end up doing what God intends you to do in the first place. And he showed me that it was not God's intentional will for God to take my father like that. That Satan used that man in sin to kill my father, to get me to turn from the Lord, to use my talents for his purposes, and then ultimately turn around and destroy me also in the end. And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. I fluctuate between two, 250, 255. I used to do professional wrestling for three and a half years. And I couldn't do it in the flesh. But if Satan had appeared in that room, I would have tried to rip his throat out. I mean, that's how angry I was, that I found out I'd been lied to for that long. And I took that satanic Bible, and I threw it across the room. And I took my demon ring off, and I threw it down. And I said, this, I don't want this stuff anymore. It's a lie. He said, now what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I said, there's probably a contract out on me anyway because I'm defecting. I don't know. I'll just, I'll just get along. And he said, no. He said, Jesus wants you. I said, yeah, I bet. He goes, no, Jesus really wants you. He said, in fact, when Satan's through with you, he's through with you. When Jesus uses you, he continues to use you as long as you're usable, as long as you're, you're open to being used. I said, well, I don't know. He said, have you ever talked to the Lord? And I said, not for a long, long time. He said, would you like to do that today? I don't know how. He said, talk to him like you would your dad. That's okay. And I went down, and, and for the first time, I got down on my knees in the chapel. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's a milestone. Because as a high priest, I used to have people bow to me. But for me to get on my knees, that just wasn't done. 
And I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, I said, I don't even know where to start. I said, I just, I, I'm sorry for all the things that I've done and I renounced Satan and everything that I ever did for him. They told me that I rose up off that ground, actually levitated on my knees an inch off that ground, off that floor. And how to explain it to you, but I felt something evil tear out of my chest. And I slumped down. I was empty for the first time. And it, he says, now, just ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior. And I did. Asked him to come in and be my master from now on. And he, I, I thought that was it. You know, I, I was full and I was feeling happy and I was feeling joyous and I get ready to get up. And he said, now you're going to need the power of God in your life. You're going to need the spirit, power of the spirit, he said, because what you were in, Satan's going to come back at you with full guns loaded. He said, and I said, what's that? And, you know, praise God, I don't know how many ministers would have done that. He took the next two and a half to three hours going through all the scriptures about the Holy Spirit, who he is, what he does, how he does it, and why you need him. And he looked at me and he said, do you want it? I said, I want everything. I've missed out on this stuff for seven years. I want everything. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I got a double whammy. I got saved and filled with God's Spirit the same day. And they gave me a Bible because I was so hungry to find out what the truth was. I'd lived a lie for seven years. I wanted to find out what the truth was. And I couldn't wait. Couldn't wait to tell. I hugged my friend. And all the way home, we were talking about the Lord. We were talking about how I was feeling. And I said, I hope this isn't just a feeling that I'm feeling today and tomorrow I'm going to be back in the old way. He said, no. He said, you died today. You died. You're a new creature. He said, that's what you need to walk in. And I couldn't wait to tell. And you know, the old first person that I had to tell was my Satanist wife. <laughs> and I ran up to the door. And she met me at the door. And I, I, I got ready to tell her. And she, she looked at me and she said, you went and did it, didn't you? You're one of those Christians now. And I looked up and I went, oh God, here we go. You know, but praise God, I mean, the Lord finally brought that relationship to an end because how many know that if you're not of the same spirit, no matter what your relationship is, it's not going to work. Not going to work. You don't look for Mr. or Mrs. Wright. You see if they know Mr. Wright. Okay. In 1972, one of the things that we got to see because of our position, because of my position, was a pamphlet sent out by the church called the Clovenhoof Two. The Clovenhoof II was a black pamphlet, and in that were instructions either for your group or plans that the church or what we refer to as the Illuminati were planning on doing. Now, you need to understand that the Illuminati to a Satanist, you're told that they are very powerful satanic spiritual beings, which is not altogether false because the people who claim to be the Illuminati are possessed by those beings. Okay? And... They said that they sent out this pamphlet, and I saw this in 72. I opened up this pamphlet, and there was a 12-step plan for United States takeover by the year 1984. They were trying to follow right along with George Orwell's book, 1984. The only reason it didn't happen was there were three steps on that plan that didn't take place. The first one was they wanted to create a pseudo-fuel shortage. Now, how many remember in 1973, we were going around, and all they were telling you the gas may be having to be rationed out? because we were running low, and all of a sudden here come all these planes flying over the ocean, all huge tankers just sitting there. So that got thwarted. The second step that didn't happen on that was all crops south of the Mason-Dixon line didn't get destroyed. Because if that would have happened, food chain would have literally come to a halt, and grocery stores would have been bare within days. The third step that didn't take place was the assassination of all major evangelists in the United States. Every major evangelist had a hit contract out on them, sent out by the church. And I remember Billy Graham uh, saying years ago on, on a, uh, one of his television crusades that he felt like his life was in danger more so than any other time. He doesn't know how right he was. The only reason that they couldn't get to him is because the power of God and protection of God was all over those men. And they find out they couldn't get to him physically, so what they did is they hired church hookers to go and set them up sexually. We can't destroy the minister, so we'll destroy their ministry. So people like Jim Baker... Jimmy Swaggart, and multi-dozens of others all got set up and their ministry destroyed. One of the steps on that plan said this, we will infiltrate the education and media system. We will find a way to make evil look cute. We will seize and capture the minds of all youth. We will implant within them satanic and luciferian doctrine, theology, and ideology. Then we will take that child and generate him up into adulthood. 
And as he reaches adulthood, he will pass those things down from generation to generation, from his childhood to the next childhood to the next childhood, until we have captured the minds of every individual. Tonight, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the steps that they have taken to do just that. They have found a way to make evil look cute, and we're buying it by the drove. A lot of things that we look at now, we look on the surface, and we look at it and we see it as being innocent. How many know that Satan doesn't come through the front door? He never comes at you from the front because that would be giving himself away. What he does is he gets you looking on, on something in, from the front, and he slips in through the back. And that's how that operates. And if he can have you afraid of something, he's got control. He controls through fear. One of the things that are out now are the slasher movies. And they're all directed toward teenagers. How many know what I'm talking about? They're all directed to teenagers. That's their target. And I mean, parents, these things are graphic. Graphic. Uh, one that comes to mind is the, the movie Halloween. How many have seen Halloween? For those of you who haven't seen it, there's a young man named Michael Myers. Michael Myers ends up stabbing his sister to death with a big butcher knife on the Halloween. And he gets into an institution because they think that he w was insane. He gets into an institution and he grows up into adulthood. And the doctor that worked with him all the way from childhood to adulthood now says that every time he looks into Michael Myers' eyes, he sees nothing but pure evil. And on the night of Sam Hain, which is what we call Halloween, how many know Halloween is nothing more than a celebration of death? Okay, it's the worship of the Celtic god Sam Hain, god of the dead. On the night of Sam Hain, Michael Myers escapes from that institution, kills his first victim, which is a worker, seals the overalls off of this worker, and a mask, a Halloween mask that he had in the front seat of his car. And now throughout the rest of the movie, you have a maniacal dressed killer in a Halloween costume, and I mean, he goes around and he kills teenagers and he kills them graphically and supernaturally. I mean, he uses things that you wouldn't even imagine would kill somebody like a broomstick. And the worst part of it is you can't kill him. You shoot him, he gets back up. You burn him, no big deal. He's good as new. Blow him up, pff, nothing to him. And at the end of the movie... I mean, the, the whole thing is like a ride, and, and that's what they're designed to do. It's like a roller coaster ride. You know, when you go up to a roller coaster and you get to the very top of that thing, and you know you're going to go hundreds of miles an hour down the other end. You know, the thing is that if you can throw your hands up in the air, you the man. And if your girlfriend can do it, she the girl. And that's the thrill of it. And it's a thrill ride. And so the whole object is to be able to sit there, to, to see if you can sit there with your girlfriend or boyfriend and watch this thing while people your own age are being slaughtered on a big screen. And I mean, it's graphic. And we wonder why our children wake up at night having screaming nightmares. And, you know, just when the last of the movie, when they think they kill him and he's gone, no, he's back. Halloween 2, Michael Myers returns. Halloween 3, Halloween 4, Halloween H2O. Praise God, I hope that's the end of it because they cut his head off in the end. And that's supposed to be the end. Now we've got a new one. Scream. Scream 2. Now, praise God, Scream 3. End of the trilogy. I sure hope so. And isn't it coincidence that the killer is again dressed in a Halloween costume. And he uses a high technology because he uses a cell phone to find his victims. And then stabs them. And they're teenagers. Now, you look at that and you think, well, you know, teenagers. I mean, that's teenage movies. Okay. Let's hypothetically say that our teenagers are, you know how they all do that. They love to go for a ride out in the country, you know, on walls. They're just riding. And they go out and on this road and, you know, your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever is, is in the car. And you're going for a ride and you decide to stop just to talk. And you're, you're sitting there talking, and, you know, like most cars, after you turn them off, they either start up or they don't. And let's say they've been listening to the radio for about a couple of hours, and then they go to turn that off, and all of a sudden, vroom, vroom, vroom. now it's a dark, desolate place. They haven't seen a car go by in hours. What's the first thing that's going to go through their heads? Gee, I hope there's nobody like Michael out here. 
I hope there's nobody like that scream guy running around, some serial killer, some maniac. But you see, it's designed to do that. That's what its purpose is, is to instill fear within our kids. And that's directed toward teenagers. A lot of those things are just, are just out there for that specific purpose, is to get our kids really, really into the point to where they are so afraid that they don't know what they're looking at anymore. And praise God, now we have even movies that are biblically based. Well, kind of. And one of the new ones is called End of Days with Arnold Schwarzenegger. How many remember Arnold? He's Bach. How many have seen End of Days? Oh, you got to go see it. You got to go see it. I mean, I mean for, for action-packed Arnold kind of rough movies, you know, like that, it's great. Biblically, it sucks. But for, for action, it's great. And in this movie, if you haven't seen this movie, there's, here's the premise. There's a group of priests who discover that nine, or 666 is actually 999 backwards. And so that the end of days, or the end of time as we know it, is actually 1999. And that if Satan comes back, I don't know where they think he is, maybe he's on vacation in Bermuda or somewhere, in the Bahamas. But he's supposed to come back to the earth and take his role in actually incarnate himself into a human being, and that there's a girl that's been chosen for him to be his special concubine, and the union of them would form the Antichrist. And that this would take place 1999. And if it's not stopped by the year 2000, life as we know it ends. Now, here's the girl, and there's people after her, and she can't figure out why. They're trying to kidnap her. Every, every place she turns around, they're trying to grab her. And now comes Arnold into the picture. And Arnold is a washed up, alcoholic, depressed cop who lost his wife and his daughter in a break-in. Two guys broke in and actually raped and killed his daughter and his wife. And now he's depressed to the point where at one point he even puts the gun in his mouth and pulls the trigger and, you know, Arnold, he doesn't have any luck, it doesn't go off. And now Arnold is assigned to protect this girl. He doesn't know why. And now the, the priests, at, at, in the middle of the movie, the priests are trying to tell him what's going on. And he's saying that they're crazy, they don't believe, he doesn't believe any of it and all this. And at one point he's in his apartment and all of a sudden he gets in confrontation with Satan the man who's incarnated in, into them. And he looks at him, and Satan says, shows him a vision of his wife and his daughter the way they used to be. And says, I can give all that back to you. All you need to do is give up the girl. And you know, bless Arnold. I mean, you know, he almost gives in, but you know, he gets that little hero, you know, attitude. And, and now he says no, and now he's at war with the Prince of Darkness. And at one point of the movie, Arnold has seen I mean, he's just loaded to the gills with man-made weaponry, and he's pumping up a shotgun, you know. His arms aren't as big as what they used to be because he's off of steroids now. But he's pumping up the gun, and the priest looks at him and says, and where are you going? And he goes, I'm going to save the world. Good luck, Arnold. Man-made weaponry against the Prince of Darkness. So he finds out that doesn't quite work real well. And now all these people are chasing him and chasing the girl. And to make a long story short, because if I was going through the whole thing, you just, you just have to see it. But at the end of this movie, in order for him to stop it, he has to destroy himself. So our hero throws himself on a spear that's being held by a statue of an angel that fell over in a church. And he impals himself on this spear, and he saves the day. And in this particular scene here, Satan turns into a big ball of flame, goes back into hell or back to Bermuda, wherever he was, and he waits for the next thousand years. And everything is okay, and Arnold saved the day. Now, as born-again Christians, we look at that thing and go, that was stupid. They didn't have anything to do with the Bible. But what about a young person who's not Bible-based? What about a young person who is not grounded in prophecy? What is the message to them? Not when all hell breaks loose and Satan takes his reign on the earth and the son of perdition arises, we don't look for our redemption to come 
and the Lord of glory to come back and burn up the wicked with the brightness of his coming. No! You look to someone like Arnold to step forward and save the world. That was my old impression. <laughs> One of the other movies that was very popular, Practical Magic. Yeah. Practical Magic. Starring Nicole Kidman, Sandra Bullock. And these are two sisters that are brought up into generational witchcraft. In fact, their aunts are, are both witches, and they bring them up as, the, as small children into, the, into the, the world of witchcraft. And Sandra Bullock, she falls in love with a mortal man, but she's afraid that if the mortal man finds out she's a witch, he'll drop her like a hot potato. So she goes into the closet. She's a closet witch. And this little mischievous lady over here has a very spirited evil boyfriend. And at one point in the movie, the evil boyfriend gets killed, and they try to bring him back, and a demon comes back with him. And now she's possessed, going after her, and at one point now, she comes out of the closet, and she decides the only way to save her sister is to come out of the closet and be the witch that she was called to be. So they have a big coming out party for her, and all the ants call all the other witches around the neighborhoods. And they all come over there, and they form this big circle out of broomsticks. And they put the young sister inside that circle, and they do their incantations and, and all their spells, and they cast that demon out, and that demon comes out, and he burns up, and he goes into ashes, and they sweep him out the door, and they've been making a big cauldron of gunk. And so what, and they sweep him out into a hole, and they take that cauldron, and they pour it over into that hole and seal him up. And then at the end, Sandra ends up marrying the mortal man, and they live happily ever after. Now I'm going to tell you something. That movie, that movie was, was entertaining. At one point, it was comical. At some point, they actually knew what they were doing when they put stuff in there. But it had a message to it. And that is that you fight witchcraft with witchcraft. You got a person put a spell on you, don't worry, go put a spell on them. You see the message that's being portrayed? Um, another, another popular TV show that's on now is called Brimstone. And Brimstone, I mean, it's atrocious. There's a cop that was a bad cop, and, and he was evil, and he dies, goes to hell. And now his assignment, given by Satan, is to go out and catch all the demons that escape from hell and bring them back. And that's the premise of the, of the show, and that's what happens every episode. He's going out and searching for these demons. Another one is South Park. I mean, if you watch South Park, that stuff is atrocious. You've got third and fourth graders, supposed to be third and fourth grade characters, and they are cursing. I mean, they are rebellious. They rebel against parental authority. And I mean, at one point, there was one episode where there was a Jesus character having a boxing match with a Satan character. And you know, TV hasn't escaped that either. Ladies, there's soap operas that have got that stuff on it. One of the ones that come to mind is called Passions. Brand new one. Complete with a witch. A good witch and a bad witch. And there's even a familiar named Timmy that can turn himself into a doll and then transpose himself into a young boy on a soap opera. And the whole premise of this thing is good against evil, but not the kind of good that we know. It's occult good against occult evil. The whole thing is that there's messages being delivered in these things. And if we're looking at it on the surface, we're not gonna see it. We're gonna have to look at it from the inside out. Another one was Days of Our Lives. For Days of Our Lives, for four to six months, they had one episode where one of the heroines was possessed, demon possessed. I mean, to the point to where they even did the makeup and everything else. And I made they, they made this girl look like they made Linda Blair look kindergarten. I mean, she this was on a soap opera, and it went all the way through. And you kept wondering, you know, are they really going to be able to cast this spirit out? They're really going to be able to cast the spirit out. And all of a sudden, here comes a defrocked priest who's in love with this girl that's possessed, and of course. 
he decides that because he's learned all these things, he's going to do an exorcism, and he does an exorcism, and finally, finally they get this demon cast out. But the whole thing is that these messages are out there. Sabrina the Teenage Witch, one of the most popular watch TV programs. And Sabrina and her friends battle evil wizards, warlocks, all through the show. And again, it's fighting witchcraft with witchcraft. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some symbols. I'm going to start out, before we get into the meat of this thing, I'm going to show you some symbols. I'm going to start out showing you symbols. These are occult symbols. And the reason for the, you seeing these symbols is you're going to see them in Pokemon. You're going to see them in video screens that you, that you see. You're going to see them in a lot of the books that we're going to go into. And you need to understand what it is that you're seeing when you see it. Now, I believe that every Christian has been given a certain amount of discernment. And what we need to do is we need to ask our Heavenly Father to sharpen that discernment so that you get this into your spirit and you get this into your mind so that when you see it, I don't have to tell you what it is. It's like, boom, all of a sudden you see it and you go, okay, that was that. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to start out with symbols. And I'm going to share these with you. Here's the first one. This is the universal symbol of Satanist churches. It's called the symbol of Baphomet. Also the goat of Mendes. And you notice now it's a five-pointed star, inverted, two points up signifying the break with Christianity. This point down symbolizing that the center is hell or Satan. And it's a circle within a circle. You notice that there's a goat's head inside this star. Now, how many remember in the Old Testament the scapegoat when the people of Israel were told to put the sins upon the scapegoat and send it out in the wilderness and that's what atoned for their sins. Now, when you're inducted into Satanism, they tell you, poor old Lucifer, he was kicked out of heaven by God and all he did was ask why God had the throne. And so now the, everything that you, 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 and you do, we have to blame it on somebody and we blame it on poor old Satan. So he's referred to as the scapegoat. And you notice that there are keys going around the outside of that circle. This is actually a writing, and it's called Enochian. Enochian keys. It's older than Sanskrit. And it actually spells out a word. And that word is Leviathan, which is the creature from the abyss, I believe in the book of Job. So this is the satanic pentagram. When you see that, you know exactly what that is, that that's the symbol of united Satanist churches. Here's the next one. This is the universal symbol of witchcraft. It's called a pentagram. The reason it's called a pentagram is it's a five-pointed star, and if you were to intersect those lines, in other words, if you were to draw those lines where they would intersect with each other, that would form the pentagram. I drew it like this so you could actually see the makeup of the star itself. Witches wear these or draw these on the floor and then stand inside of them and summon up the spirits and charge the atmosphere on the outside. And they believe that by lighting candles on each point of that star, standing inside of this and charging the atmosphere, as long as they're inside that circle, they are protected. How many know that demons don't need you to draw something on the floor if they want to really get to you? Okay? This is another way that Satan keeps them in bondage by making them think that they are the ones that are in control. Not, not the witches themselves, but that's what Satan wants them to make them think. That's how he keeps them going. Here's the next one. This is a hexagram, exactly as it sounds. This symbol is used in black magic. It comes from the Jewish Kabbalah, Jewish magic. It is a symbol of dark summoning. What I mean by that is that if you want to put a hex on somebody, you want to cause a, a spirit to come forth, this is the symbol that's used. It's called a hexagram. Now, it is not, never has been, never will be the star of David. Show me in scripture anywhere where David was instructed to come up with a symbol of a star representing him or the city or the, the country of Israel. 
It's not there. The other thing is that Solomon was a wise king, but he was also a dabbler. Why do I say that? Because Solomon had many wives, and those wives came from different cultures. And those different cultures worship different gods. And guess what they brought to the marriage with them? Witchcraft. They brought those gods with them. Why do I say that? I don't. God does. Go to 1 Kings chapter 11. Starting with verse 1. But when King Solomon loved many strange women. Why were they strange? Because they didn't worship the same God. They didn't worship the God of Israel. Together with the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, which is also called Astaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination, there's that word, of the Ammonites, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because the heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Now go to the book of Amos, chapter 5. God's getting ready to reveal something here. Chapter 5, and we're going to start with verse 25. God is not in a good mood here. The people of Israel, the children of Israel, have been very foolish, and he's correcting them like a good daddy does. And he says, in verse 24, But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? Verse 26, But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, and Cheon, your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. When Solomon had the temple built, he used a people from a land called Tyre. Tyre worshipped a god called Baal. This is the symbol of Baal, not the stars of David. This is the seal of Solomon. It comes from the Jewish Kabbalah. And in that time, that's Jewish magic. You see, not all Jews worship the same god. Does that mean that the people of Israel, because they've taken that symbol for their, the, the symbol of their country, does that mean that they're evil? No. They're deceived. It's very subtle. And Satan, how many, we all know that Satan can deceive people very, very well. Here's the next one. Everybody recognizes the one at the top. All-seeing eye. One found on the back of the dollar bill and also the, the seal of the Illuminati. But what you don't know or may not know is that the triangle has always been a very powerful occultic symbol. Because it's a spell casting symbol and it actually represents the three elements of all witchcraft. Earth, wind, and fire. Hey, wasn't there a group called that? Huh. Down here is a symbol, and it's an Egyptian symbol, and it's called the Ankh. It is the universal symbol of reincarnation. It's the worship of the sun god Ra and his son Horus. And you notice, now this was in existence before Jesus, but you notice it almost became a mockery because as it comes up, it has a cross, and then it loops. 
And that means that life doesn't end, it just continues on and on and on and on. Universal symbol of reincarnation, the onk. And you know, it, it just really gets my heart because I've been going through, y'all, on this last tour, I've been going through airport after airport, and I've seen these things being worn on, on young men with big gold chains, you know, hanging on around their neck. And I pray to God they don't know what that means. I really do. Here's the next one. Now, the one at the top you've already seen. That's a satanic pentagram. But this one down here is a very interesting symbol. This was actually introduced as a piece of jewelry in 1969, early 1970. Oh, by the way, how many have heard of Sarah Coventry jewelry? Anybody here sell it? Praise God, because Sarah Coventry jewelry is exactly as it sounds, Sarah's Coven. You see, witchcraft groups get their money to operate by two ways. The selling of themselves and drugs, or the making and selling of occult jewelry. And what they actually do is they ask this stuff to be blessed after they make it. Now, I mean, when I'm talking about blessed, I'm not talking about how God blesses us by giving us something. I'm talking about when they bless it, it means it's cursed. And they actually ask demonic entities to come and go inside of that piece of jewelry. Now I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if you believe scripture, where, where Jesus himself even says that there's such a thing as demonic possession, in other words, demons can inhabit a person, then you also must know that demons can and do inhabit inanimate objects. I've seen it happen over and over again. And praise God, you know, we go over to countries like Africa, or even closer than that, we go over to Hawaii, and we bring back these masks or these tiki dolls, and we put them on our mantle or on our wall, and think, oh, that's a great souvenir. And guess what you just brought back into your home with you? The demons that were associated with those particular gods. This is actually a Celtic symbol, and it's over 2,000 years old. Referred to as the Italian horn, the horn of plenty, or the leprechaun's horn. And actually what it means is, is that the wearer of this trusts the devil for their finances. Here are two crosses. First cross is called the Tau cross, T-A-U. And it's actually a Babylonian symbol. But what happened was the Buddhists and the Hindus picked this up and said, we like that. We're going to use that as a symbol of good luck. <laughs> good luck if you wear it. Okay? And you notice, it it's probably doesn't even mean to be, but you notice it's, it's kind of a mockery of our cross too, because as it comes up, it just stops. There's no ascension. This one down here is the inverted cross. Most of the time it's black. This is like what I saw on the, on the, uh, the wall of my mentor's house. And this is flown, this is actually one of, the, one of the biggest blasphemies of Christianity because it means that Christ did literally nothing on the cross. That's what it's supposed to represent. And these are flown at the time when black masses are taking place. And black masses are when you have your animal and human sacrifice. Here's a symbol for black mass at the top. <clears throat> And you notice that it looks like an onk, but this is actually a high priestess. And the reason I say that is, there's her symbol, which is a crescent moon. You see, in witchcraft, they don't just worship one god, they worship many. Lucifer is only one of them. One of the lesser ones, in fact. Because their highest god is actually a female god, a goddess. And her name is Diana, goddess of the moon. And this is her symbol, crescent moon and stars. Most of the time, if it's a symbol, it's a symbol of the high priestess, she'll wear it around her neck as a pendant or a brooch, and it will have the crescent moon, and it'll have one, two, three, or four stars hanging off of it, and that symbolizes her rank in that particular coven. So this is a symbol of the goddess Diana. This is the high priestess, and this over here actually is a symbol for the sacrifice getting ready to take place. A lot of law enforcement officials now are finding out that these symbols that they're finding on culverts and overpasses that they once thought were gang symbols are actually satanic cults. This symbol down here, I hope everybody can see that. This symbol right here is a really interesting symbol. Again, it's a Celtic or Druid symbol. 
And it was adopted in the 1970s by a rock and roll band called Blue Oyster Cult. And during all the, the uh, interviews that Blue Oyster Cult did with their magazine uh, people, they said all the interviews, they wanted to know why that symbol and what that symbol meant because people couldn't figure it out. And Blue Oyster Cult members told him that, well, we can't tell you what it is, but it's a very mystical symbol, and one day it will reveal itself. Well, it has. This is called the Cross of Confusion. Now, I even talked to one gentleman who at one point said, well, that's a Christian symbol because there's the cross and then there's the fisherman's hook. No. You see the hole in the cross? That symbolizes the hole in Christianity. And this going down here means Jesus went into the grave and never came back up. In other words, it's, it's a sign symbolizing that God is dead. One at the top is the new symbol for the Church of Satan. The reason I say new, <clears throat> Anton Zandor LeVay passed away in 1997 at the age of 67. He had uh, heart problems all the way through his later life. And he passed away, and for a while it looked like the church was going to go under. And I was getting kind of excited about that. And they were even on their website, they were, at, they were uh, soliciting people for money to send it in to try to save the house, which was the church. And it didn't work. And the city of San Francisco wanted to tear it down and build a complex over it. And there was a lot of estate money owed on it. And he said, uh, they, they said that it looked like it was going to go under. Sadly to say... October 31st, 1999, Carla LeVay, LeVay's oldest daughter, stepped forward and said, I'm going to follow where my father left off. I'm going to take over his estate. I'm going to take over his position. Uh, deemed herself the high priestess of the Church of Satan, and now the Church of Satan is alive and well again. This down here at the bottom has never been, never will be a symbol for peace. It's a symbol of the broken cross. When you're initiated into Satanism, you're given a ceramic cross. You're told to turn that cross upside down, take the two points and break them down. Symbolizing that there is no God. Also, in any occult book, you'll find that this is a very powerful symbol used because it's called the crow's foot when it's reversed. It's a spell casting symbol. But you see how subtle Satan got it into our... This, was about, this came out about the time when the Vietnam War was going on and the flower children. And you notice at that time, basically what it was was a rebellion against authority. But, you know, it, like tune in, tune out, turn on and tune out, to get high. And so that's what that is. Actually, that symbol. I do not know what that particular symbol, what this new symbol stands for. I have not been able to find that out. A lot of the people that I was in, in touch with, that I was able to ask, uh, have moved away or I just can't get a hold of them anymore. So I have my resources are, are not around too much. I know that that looks like a symbol for infinity, but what that double cross here, unless that's exactly what it's supposed to mean, is double cross. But I'm not sure exactly what that is. Here's the next one. One at the top is a symbol for anarchy. It means you're against everything. Parental authority, government authority, no matter what it is, you're against it. One down here in the bottom is an interesting symbol. You've all seen the all-seeing eye, the pyramid. Well, this is another symbol for the seal of the Illuminati. It's a circle within a circle. This circle on the outside is supposed to represent the networks that go about making up the Illuminati, and this circle in the inside is supposed to represent all the men who make up the actual Illuminati itself. <laughs> but what you may not realize is that the circle in paganism and other cultures has another meaning to it, and that is that it represents the female womb or female fertility. So when you see the circle and other things that have to do with paganism or have to do with witchcraft, you can associate that with feminine spirit power, having to do with fertility rights, having to do with the female womb. The circle has always been a very powerful symbol. Always has been, always will be until the time that witchcraft no longer exists. Witches use that to represent themselves to other witches. And a lot of times on a lot of their symbols, what they'll wear on their, their, their hats or they'll wear on a, on a brooch will be nothing more than a metallic circle. And that represents them as being witchcraft and also a feminine spirit power. So when you see that, now you'll know what that means. Circle within a circle or just the circle itself as being a very powerful symbol in witchcraft. 
And this is the next symbol. And this, again, is the symbol of the goddess Diana. You'll see there's the crescent moon and there's the star. Now, the stars doesn't have to be particular in that particular order. I've seen them where they're coming down a straight line here, where they're going into a curve. And again, like I told you most of the time, if it's a high priestess, if it's a symbol of the high priestess, it'll be a crescent moon here, and then there would be one, two, three, or four stars hanging off of there, depending on their rank in that particular witchcraft coven. This one down here at the bottom is a newer symbol, and it's actually used by what I call the dabblers. You see, there's, there's two basic facets that I want to actually state here of witchcraft or Satanism. And that is that you have the ones that are the elite, and that means those are the planners. In other words, how are we going to get witchcraft into the school system? How are we going to get uh, into the education system? How are we going to get it into uh, the, the toys? How are we going to get it into the books? Those are the ones that do the planning. Those are the ones I refer to as being the elite. Then you have the dangerous ones, and the dangerous ones are considered to be the dabblers. The dabblers are the ones that are going to grab a cat and take it out and on, a, on a tombstone somewhere and, and choke it to death or stab it with a knife thinking that they're going to get favoritism from the devil. Okay? Those are the dabblers. Those are the ones who are dangerous because those are the ones who are getting the stuff out of a book somewhere, reading it, and then going out and trying it. Okay? In this particular, this is actually a symbol of the dabblers. Now this is teenage Satanism. Right here is their, their symbol. And this means the left-hand path. And the reason for that is, you see that broken arrow there? That's a break with all parental authority, all uh, 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 any kind of authority whatsoever in that circle. It means they're breaking out of that circle and they're following this symbol here the black path which is referred to as Satan. So this means that you're breaking away from everything and you're following the left-hand path. And that's what that symbol is referred to is the symbol of the left-hand path. Here's the next one. Now this is an important symbol for you to get into your mind. These are two mazes. The first one up here at the top is called the labyrinth. And if you notice it comes around and then it has an opening here. That stands for feminine serpent power. And it's a powerful symbol for feminine fertility. And the reason for that is, is that symbol symbolizes the womb. This down here symbolizes male fertility or male serpentine spirit power. And if you see that, I don't know if you can see that. See that? It's, it comes into a double-headed snake. See the head there? And then right here. Those are supposed to be forming two snakes as it comes around. And that's called the spiral. And the spiral in paganism, both of these are pagan symbols. And one at the top, the labyrinth, actually represents feminine fertility. The one at the bottom represents the spiral male fertility power. This is the next one. This is the satanic S or satanic Z. This was adopted um, in the 1970s by a rock and roll band called KISS. And they adopted that on the end of their name, thinking that people would think it looked cool. Actually, it stood for Kings in Satan's Service. And because they were serving Satan, in fact, Gene Simmons, the bass player, the leader of the group, even is a professed Satanist and says that he likes being demon-possessed. And Satan has always been referred to as a lightning bolt. Where do I get that? If you go to the book of Luke, chapter 18, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 18, it says, in Jesus speaking, it says, And I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Satanists grabbed onto that right quick and said, Cool, we'll make Satan a lightning bolt, and that'll be his representation. And we can put that in things, and people won't know what that means. We can get our symbol on things, whether it's a toy, whether it's in a video game or whatever. We can get that in a book. People won't know what that means. Okay? They didn't count on discerning Christians. This was also adopted by the Nazi SS. How many know that Hitler was a very avid follower of the occult? Hitler believed in a spear of destiny. Occult theology has said there was a spear of destiny. And he believed, because the, this occult theology said that the holder of this spear would become the ruler or the master of the world. 
And every time that Hitler and his army would invade a particular city, the first thing that he would do would be to send out his soldiers to gather up all the occult books in that particular area. Because he was looking for that one book that told him where to find the Spear of Destiny. He never found it. But Satan is referred to as a lightning bolt. And so that double S up there is what that symbol is. The symbol of Satan. Here's the next one. Now this is very interesting. If you see here, there's the satanic pentagram. But this symbol down here actually started out as being a Buddhist symbol. In Buddhism. And it meant good luck. And prosperity. Now, remember that Hitler was a very avid follower of the occult. He was also a very avid follower of one of the most infamous Satanists of all time named Aleister Crowley. And Mr. Crowley wrote a book called Magic, M-A-J-I-C-K. And in that book he said, let all initiates of the satanic doctrine do all things backwards. Walk backwards, talk backwards, write backwards, and play backwards. And that way, people will look at you and think you're either eccentric or just simply insane, let you alone and let you go ahead and do your activities without any, anybody per persecuting you. So Satan have known this for, for many, many hundreds of years. And they've been doing things backwards, writing things backwards. You want to know if something is of God or not? Reverse it. Look here. What Hitler did was take that symbol, follow Aleister Crowley, and reverse it. And that's all he did. Simply reverse it and made it mean something else. Again, he was a follower of Aleister Crowley, and that's what Aleister Crowley said to do in his book, Magic. Symbol at the top again, hexagram. Once you see it again. This down here is a scarab. It's also an Egyptian symbol of reincarnation. And where they get this from is really... Uh, well, listen, when the, when the Egyptians used to watch dung beetles, D-U-N-G, okay, dung beetles, push camel dung, little balls of camel dung across the ground, they looked at that and in their great wisdom said, that's the way the sun gods move the sun across the sky. And they saw these dung beetles actually bury the dung into the ground and then days later, a beetle come out of it, and they assumed right away that this was that same beetle that went into the ground coming back up as a new beetle. In other words, reincarnated. Well, what actually happened was the beetle went in there and laid eggs, and one of the new beetles came out. But they looked at that. I mean, and that's, that goes to show you what kind of wisdom actually goes in to build up a lot of this occult theology. But it's, it's a symbol, again, of reincarnation. Uh, in some cultures, it's also referred to as a, a symbol for uh, good luck and prosperity. Here's the next one. One at the top is symbol for sexual ritual. Again, these are the dabblers that are coming up with these particular symbols here. Like I said, they're starting to find these on culverts and overpasses and things and finding out that these are not actual gang symbols now, that they are actual occult satanic symbols. And it, this is a symbol for satanic sexual ritual. And down in here is the cross, the satanic cross of justice. That's why it has the pitchfork uh, type appendages on the bottom of that. Again, this is put out by the dabblers. This is not the elite. These are the dabblers who are going out there and thinking that it's cool to worship Satan and that Satan rules and, you know, it's, it's fun to go out and kill cats and whatever else you can find and sacrifice them to Satan. These are two symbols here. The first one at the top is for blood ritual. It means it is sacrifice, blood sacrifice. And down here is satanic justice. Whenever a Satanist defects and they have a contract out on them, because I'm going to tell you something, when you defect from the Satanic Church, you're not playing around with a group of penny ante people. They put a contract out. I had a contract out on my life. One a, a gentleman asked me, he said, weren't you ever afraid when you got out? I was scared to death. Until the Lord gave me a vision. And that was him walking into these gates, taking the parchment paper out of Satan's hand that I had actually signed my name and blood on, 
pulling it out of his hand, taking a key from him and saying, he's mine now. And I've never worried about it since. But this is the symbol for satanic justice. This is, top one is the incursive hexagram. And this was the symbol that Aleister Crowley came up for his infamous organization called the Golden Dawn. And this was their symbol. Down here is a New Age symbol. And how many know the New Age is not new at all? It's just a return to the old craft. It's actually witchcraft, paganism. It's going back to the old ways. There's nothing New Age about it. And this symbolizes Holy Earth. You know, the Mother Gaia, have you hugged your tree today type thing. <laughs> this one up here at the top is Bad Company. Again, these are the dabblers. Up here means bad company. Uh, a lot of people looked at and thought that was uh, a seal for a uh, gang called the folk. It's not. This is actually a satanic symbol. Those three up there, the three leaders of this particular group, and this shows that there are one, two, three other members in that group, and that the ladies are right here. One, two, three. Bad company. And that's what it refers to. Again, the triangle, earth, wind, and fire, always been a very powerful spell-casting symbol. Earth, wind, and fire. Symbol at the top is called Viv, and it's a voodoo symbol. And I want to tell you that I thought that Las Vegas was going to be the sin capital of the world. How many have heard that? Okay, I mean, on tour, and I believe it was last month that I was there, yeah. Last month, I, I was fully expected to see Las Vegas be the sin capital of the world. I mean, I, I, I fully expected to walk in and see all kinds of things going on. But you know what? It has, it has nothing over New Orleans. New Orleans is witchcraft central. I mean, you walk down there and every place you turn is voodoo. They even have a store in there that you can walk in and for 1995... You can buy a witchcraft doll and a voodoo doll, and you can make your own hexes and everything else. Isn't that great? So that's what this is, is a symbol of voodoo. Okay, right here. And down in here is called the wheel, or the wheel of life. Again, this is another symbol that life continues on and on and on, and it doesn't stop. Anything that you, anytime that you see a wheel like this, it means that it continues. Symbol at the top is the all-seeing eye of Horus. Again, Egyptian symbol, another reincarnation symbol. This symbol at the bottom is a very interesting symbol, and I want to tell you about it. It's a Celtic symbol. It's a Druid symbol. And it's over 2,000 years old. And you need to understand that at the time of the Celts, over 2,000 years old, when the Celtic religion was flourishing, they worshipped many deities, but the greatest deity that they worshipped was a triple goddess. Now, in Christianity, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and they are all male in origin. In their religion, they have a triple goddess, and it's all female. And this is that symbol. This stands for the mother goddess, which represents integrity, this is the daughter goddess that, under, that represents uh, wisdom. And this is the crone or the child and represents the earth and all power. And then this is the circle that intertwines them throughout life. In other words, the power that intertwines them throughout life. This was also adopted in 1970 by a rock and roll band called Led Zeppelin. And they put it on Led Zeppelin IV, which is also actually uh, uh, referred to as Led Zeppelin runes. And runes are Celtic fortune-telling symbols. And this is one of the symbols that are in runes. But this is a 2,000-year-old symbol. It's Celtic, and it means the worship of a triple goddess. Sarah Covedry specialty. Look at this. Now you can get 
the symbol of the triple goddess. There's the mother, the daughter, the crone. And now they've taken the circle out and bless their hearts, they put it in a triangle. Isn't that nice? Now, now guys, you know what to get your wife for her anniversary. Not. Here it appears on a New Age, again, New Age is not New Age, book called Aquarian Conspiracy, put out by a lovely woman named Marilyn Ferguson. And Marilyn Ferguson, bless her heart, seems to think that all the social problems on the face of the earth are caused by us, the Christians, because we worship this one God, not all the many ones that should be worshipped. And she seems to think that the greatest thing that could happen is for us to be wiped off so this new thought can come into existence. And that this new thought will not take place until we're gone. Now I have a question. If that particular symbol is 2,000 years old, it's a Celtic symbol, and it means the worship of their triple goddess, what in the world is it doing on something we call holy? Now, you can only come to two conclusions, only two. Number one, Nelson Publishing Company said, well, that's the uh, symbol for the, for the uh, Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Or, that's on there because it is a counterfeit version of God's Word. If you take the New King James Bible and compare it to the King James Bible, you will find words that have been omitted, left off, downplayed, and downright perverted. I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. You ever run across a version of God's Word that even downplays one little bit the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, you get rid of that thing. Because the blood of Jesus is what gives you your spiritual authority to trample over Him and His minions. Yes. Praise God. That was for somebody. <laughs> Here is a little bit of Celtic jewelry. I won't go through and tell you what all of it means. I think you can pretty much figure it out. There's your, your triangles intertwined with each other. There's your pentagram. This is actually a good luck charm right here. <laughs> There's your pentagram again. This is a wolf's head and is actually supposed to give you animal spirit power. Okay. Down in here you see what looks like a horned beast. This is actually supposed to represent the god Pan. P-A-N. So that's, that's a little bit of Celtic jewelry. Now, let's look at some of the jewelry that is out there today. Here's a good, nice piece. Look at this. Here you have a pendant that has your pentagram on it. Look, now you can get your crescent moon and stars around it. Lovely piece. I mean, that'd go with any dress, wouldn't it? <laughs> Praise God. Look at this. Now you can get your pentagram and your horoscope with it. Because this is your pentagram and all these symbols around there represent astrology symbols. So you can wear that thing 24 hours a day and attract all the good fortune you want. <laughs> Along with other things. <laughs> Amen. Look at this. This comes from Blue Moon Jewelry. Look here. Here's your pentagram. Here's your crescent moon, and now you've got your goddess hanging off of it. Wouldn't that be lovely? And guys, if you're really into eroticism, you can get one made of goddesses. Everybody see that? That's a pentagram made of goddesses, and the legs are forming actually the pentagram. Nude goddesses. Here's another one. Here's your pentagram. And now you have a crystal hanging off of it. Now in occultism, a crystal is a very powerful symbol because they believe that that stone actually can catch and harness the powers of the sun, the moon, the stars in that particular jewel. And when you wear that thing around your neck, you've got people wearing this thing thinking that it's attracting goodwill, good fortune, good charm, good luck, and prosperity. Well, it doesn't attract any of those things. It attracts demons. Okay? So that's the kind of thing that we've got out there today. And again, these are not things that you have to 
boggle your mind to find. These are things that are in your own backyard. You can go to your jewelry stores and find these things. Here's one. This is particularly for witches because now you can get a pendant with your pentagram on it. There's your magic wand, your chalice, and your athame, which is your, your magical dagger. And you wear all those as a pendant around your neck. I'm going to show you one of my favorites. Look at this. And they're really bold now. Because they say, Behold the power of the crystal when it is endowed with the magic of Merlin. A remarkable pendant bearing the image of the master sorcerer, sculptured in sterling silver and coated in 24 karat gold, set with a stunning amethyst crystal and a genuine emerald. A rich reminder of the glories of Arthur's kingdom and a good fortune amulet to wear proudly. This is, this is my very favorite. My very favorite. Look at this. This is a good way to usher in the millennium. With an Egyptian millennium pendant. Mark the millennium by wearing the ancient Egyptian symbol of enduring life, the Ankh. Once prized by the pharaohs, now crafted for you in sterling silver, paired with a stunning falcon symbol of the sun god Horus, bathed in radiant 24 karat gold, the fitting way to celebrate the world's glorious history and the promise of the universe as it unfolds for the next thousand years. Both symbols together form a brooch, separate them for a dynamic pendant. So now you can wear it like this, or you can take this off and have this and have your two little onks on the side. So now, ladies, you know what you can get your husband for their anniversary. These are being found all over, uh, all over jewel stores, uh, even uh, stores where they sell the little pewter statues. And these are swords with your crystal in it. Depending on what your birthday is, it has, actually has your, your stone for that. So that it attracts goodwill and good fortune and good luck and good luck if you wear it. This is the fairy star. How many know that fairies are actually demons? It comes from Celtic folklore. So when you tell your child about the tooth fairy, you're actually talking about a demon. Okay? This is that particular star, the fairy star, and each one of those points stand for specific elements that make up the universe. The fairy star. Here is Sarah Coventry. And now they're not even afraid to come out and be bold and present it in a nice piece of jewelry. Look at this. There's your triple goddess complete with a crystal looking ball in the middle of that thing. And this is jewelry that you can go out and actually buy, purchase. Here's again the symbol, that particular same symbol. And now it's intertwined. And you know what those are? Those are serpents. See the head? Those are serpents. Isn't that lovely? This again is a symbol for the triple goddess. And the reason I say that is, you'll see that there are three crescent moons. Remember that their highest goddess is a goddess called Diana. There's her symbol. There's one, two, three, and then there's the circle of life. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that the same symbol that's used for uh, hazardous waste material? Huh. You know, let's, let's get something straight here. God doesn't need symbols. God does not need symbols to identify things of his, his realm. Who needs symbols? We do. Man has been a symbolic creature ever since history began. We've needed something to represent this and some other symbol to represent that. Because somehow or another we can't tell one thing from the other without a symbol. We call them now logos. Everywhere you look. Every particular company's got a particular logo that identifies them and separates them from something else. We are very symbolic. Dream catcher. These things in Indian lore are supposed to filter out, catch and filter out bad dreams. Do you know what they actually do? 
They actually filter in the bad dreams. Talked to a lady about a month ago who, on, on the phone who was very upset. Uh, her child had been given one of these dream catchers as a plaything over the baby's crib and put it on over the baby's crib and thinking that it was going to filter out the bad dreams. This baby would not sleep for three straight months. Three months, this baby couldn't sleep. I mean, wake up in the middle of the night screaming. And dad would go in and hold him. And mom would go in and hold him. And it wouldn't work. They'd lay him down in the crib and they'd go back to bed and the baby would start screaming again. I told him, remove this thing. Get that thing out of your house. It's cursed. She did. She pleaded the power of the blood of Jesus over it. Said she's casting it out of her life. Cast it out. The next night, she said the baby slept perfectly. These things are designed for another purpose other than what they tell you they're designed for. In other words, what they say is one thing. What they actually do is something else. I think, though, that you can see how subtle this whole stuff is. I mean, if he can get it, if Satan can get this stuff in jewelry and get us to wear it around our neck, thinking that it represents good fortune or, or you know, good luck or charm and everything else like that, and we go about wearing it, I mean, what better way for him to get a foothold in our life? Now, a lot of things come over from the Orient. A lot of things come over from the Orient. And some things have a big impact on us, and some things don't. I can't think of anything that come over from the Orient that actually had a big impact or a phenomenon type craze other than Godzilla. But there is something new that's come over to the United States and has actually captured the minds and the imagination of every single child. And you know what? It's not new at all. Japanese kids have been watching this thing since 1995. It started out as a cartoon, went to a comic book, they made it into a video game, went to toys, collectible card game. Now, praise God, there's even a, a movie on it. And it was started in 1995. It's not new, but it's new to kids, and they're eating it up. And it's called Pokemon. And it stands for Pocket Monster. And it even made the cover of Time Magazine. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is, do you notice any symbol up there that you've seen before? The spiral. And it stands for what? Male fertility. Okay? Now... This thing is actually called Polyworld, but they actually had another name for it before they renamed it. When this creature first came out, it was called Hypno. And they changed it to Polyworld to make it a little more innocent. But you see what it actually does is it's supposed to be able to mesmerize and hypnotize its enemies. And you can see how that would happen. That starts spinning around and it's just like one of those hypnotic wheels that, that they use to hypnotize. And you see up here in the top, here's a creature, an alligator type creature over here, dragon. Kind of a funny duck build thing down here. And this is an interesting character over here. This character over here is called Mewtwo. And Mewtwo looks like an alien. If you look at him real carefully, he looks like an alien. But you know, the first thing that I noticed about that thing is, when I looked at it, and I looked at those eyes... I said, you know what? That kind of looks like the things that we used to pray to inside that circle. Now you notice that he has a particular salute that he's given. And he's in this pose. Every time that you see Mewtwo, he's in this pose. Now he has three fingers. And those three fingers are always sticking out like that. Now he doesn't have five fingers like we do. He has three. But if they were the three on us, they'd be this. And that doesn't mean hook them horns, doesn't mean I love you, doesn't mean one more, it means hail Satan. It's the satanic salute that all Satanists identify themselves with. And it says here, you look here, it says for many kids it's now an addiction, <laughs> very much so. Cards, video games, toys, a new movie, is it bad for them? What we need to look at is whether or not 
that particular statement holds true. Is it bad for them? Here's one of the characters. Cute little one. Everybody, okay, everybody go, oh, come on. I know, I know you wanted to do that, see, that's why I did that. He's cute. But the one thing I noticed about him right off, this is Pikachu, one thing I noticed about him right off was his tail. It's a lightning bolt, and it's a satanic Z. It even comes down here to a point. Now, just by looking at him enough, alone is not enough to really be able to say, okay, yeah, that's bad, or that's satanic. What we first need to do is we need to look at the actual production of these things. And the first thing we need to do is we need to look at who actually produced the trading card game that has captured the minds and the imaginations of our children. Now, it doesn't make any difference what I say, it's what their own material says, because their own material will give them away. Okay? So I'm going to read to you, here's the direct quote from the, the web pages of the producer of this game. Listen to this. The Pokemon trading card game is a new collectible card game that is made and distributed by Wizards of the Coast. What is a wizard? Male practitioner of black magic. Wizards of the Coast, the same company that made the best-selling game Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering is a heavily occult-laced trading card game which has been very popular in the 90s. And I should also tell you that Wizards of the Coast also owns a subsidiary company named TSR, and TSR is the company that puts out all Dungeons and Dragons material. So let's look at Magic the Gathering, because this is the same company that puts out Pokemon. So let's see where they're coming from. Now, from seeing the symbols, your, your actual discernment should now begin to be sharpened. How many see a circle? How many see a pentagram? Yeah. If you look, there it is. See that? Magic the Gathering. This is a role-playing game. Now, parents, in case you don't know what that is, that means that your child actually becomes a character in the game actually becomes a part of the game. And that's what makes it exciting is there's not many games out there that they can actually become a part of. They can play it, but they don't actually become a part of it. In this particular game, they actually do become a character in the game. And remember it said that it's an occult game. One of the dangers of this thing is being a role-playing game is that it's played with the mind. How many know that the mind is a very fragile thing? And what happens is, in these role-playing games, I'm going to use the example of Dungeons & Dragons because TSR is the one that puts out all their material. The danger of Dragons, Dungeons & Dragons or any kind of role-playing game like this is that it's played with the mind, and when played with the mind, the mind begins to lose that fine line with what's real and what's fantasy. And the more you get into the fantasy world, the more it seems real, and all of a sudden now you don't know what's real and what's not. In Dungeons and Dragons, this is a game played by three or four people. And what you do is you have one particular person that's the dungeon master, and he sets all the rules up for this thing. And then in your mind, you actually fight battles. You go through mazes, you go through dungeons, and you actually fight wars with evil wizards, dragons, demons powerful satanic beings. It's all in the mind. And I mean, if you've got a vivid imagination, you can have one heck of a game. And what happens is, is that you can play this game for 10 to 12 years. Because the object is, as long as your character is alive, you're in the game. Once your character dies or gets killed in that particular game, you're out. So you can imagine that if a person loses touch with reality and now they've actually become that character, Guess what? Anything that happens to that character now happens to them. And there's overwhelming evidence, psychiatrists and psychologists both tell us, there's overwhelming evidence showing that a lot of teenage suicides that are caused by Dungeons and Dragons are caused because the player has finally lost touch with reality. And what's happened to them now, 
they actually feel a psychic bond with that character. And so the character gets killed off and no longer in the game. You have no, no purpose because all your purpose was for the last 10 to 12 years was playing Dungeons and Dragons. So your character gets knocked off. Guess what? So do you. So let's go back to Magic the Gathering. Here's one of the cards. Yeah, isn't he cute? This is Cabal Ghoul. Now, you notice that there's counters up here. In other words, this stands for two points. And it says Cabal Ghoul. Now, if, in case you don't know what a ghoul is, it's a dead, rotting, decaying thing that's been in the ground and magically summoned back to life. So you have a walking dead thing. And that's what a ghoul is. And in this particular thing, it says, at the end of each turn, put a one plus one counter on Cabal Ghoul for each other creature that died during the turn and was not regenerated. In other words, you have cards that'll actually keep your character alive for a certain amount of time. Here's another interesting card. Because it's called the All Hallows Eve card. Again, this is all in magic. Magic the Gathering. By the way, there was a news clip that I read about two weeks ago that spoke of a young boy in Maine. I don't remember what the town was, but it was in Maine. And he came home one day and asked his mother about Magic the Gathering and said that the teacher had decided to use Magic the Gathering, this card game, as a new and exciting way to teach mathematics in, in school, in their class. And they even formed what was called a magic club, and that all the kids were part of this magic club. Well, the mother said, well, you're not going to become a part of that. You're not going to be in that. But one of the kids had given him one of the cards, and that card he showed to his mother, and that card was called Necromancer. And on that card, it showed spiritual beings actually being risen up out of the ground, out of their grave. And then he asked his mother, what does summon mean? And she said, why do you ask that? And she said, he told her, he said, because all the kids on recess go outside on the school grounds, pick up huge sticks, wave them in the air, and say, spirits, enter me. True. This is all Hallow's Eve. Again, two points symbolized by two skulls. Here's your demonic black cat. I guess it's a black cat. I've never seen anything look like that. There's your demon in the middle, jack-o'-lantern, full moon, and it says this card is called sorcery. Sorcery comes from the Greek word pharmakeia. It's where we get the word pharmaceutical. In occultism, it's witchcraft through drugs, sorcery. And it says put two counters on this card, remove a counter during your upkeep, and when you remove the last counter from All Hallows' Eve, all players take all creatures from their graveyards and put them directly into play. Treat these creatures as though they were just summoned. You choose what order they come into play. Remember that, again, this is a role-playing game. This is called the Magician. I wonder why. Here you see the man kneeling, and look, he's forming with his hands the triangle. Right there. And he's kneeling in front of a flame. There are the crescent moons behind him. Over here can only be demons. Hellfire all around here. And it's called the Magician. And these are collectible cards. And these are cards that one day your child may come home with. Or may know of a student that has given him some of these cards. Now you will know what they are. So let's go back to Pokemon. Because now we've, we've, we've already established that the same company that puts out that game and puts out Dungeons and Dragons puts out cute little Pokemon. Isn't that interesting? Now, before we go any further, I want to see that if we as a group can agree on something. So I need little audience participation here to say yes or no. Okay? We, are you into that? Yeah. Okay. Listen to me carefully. If we examine the characters of this particular program, and they are the kind of role models that we want our kids to be watching. In other words, if, if this whole game, the characters of this game, the monsters, this whole premise of this thing actually goes to establish the kind of values, the kind of standards, and the kind of morals that we want our kids to have when they reach adulthood, that it's okay. 
In other words, if they actually help to establish the kind of morals, values, and standards that we want our children or our grandchildren to have when they get to be an adult, that it must be all right. Can we agree on that? Yes. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to examine and see what kind of role models we have in this game. Now, what we need to do then, everybody go, oh, again. Oh, I know, he's cute, isn't he? Little satanic tail. Up here is the Pokemon ball. Okay, that's this thing here. Okay, and inside of that, you catch the Pokemon. Let the camera get a view of that. That's the Pokemon ball, and you actually catch the monster inside of that thing and harness the power in there. And then you can call on that power to regenerate itself outside of that ball. And praise God, it turns into a bigger and better monster. Now, we're told that there are 150 species of these particular creatures on the face of the earth. And we're also told in the material that these pocket monsters are creatures that inhabit the world with humans. And that they can evolve and grow in bigger and better creatures. Now, the object of this game is got to catch them all. And they tell you that if you catch them all, you become a Pokemon master. Listen, parents, that word master will appeal to any child because they can become a somebody. They can become a master. And you know what? If you're the master of something, you don't need mom, you don't need dad, you don't need grandparents, you don't need aunts and uncles, you don't need school, and you probably don't even need a church because you're a master. You can become a god. That's the premise of what this has been teaching. You become the Pokemon master. That's the whole premise and the whole goal of this game. Now, this is the main character right here. He's called Ash Ketchum. Not Hal Ketchum, but Ash Ketchum. Okay? And I'm, again, it doesn't make any difference what I say. It's what their own material says. I'm going to tell you what, what they describe him as. Listen to this. An energetic and determined 10-year-old who's a little too competitive, and he's obsessed with catching all Pokemon and driven to become the world's foremost Pokemon master. And, you know, every time that your children watch this program, whether it's a video, whether it's a cartoon, whether it's a comic book, no matter what it is, they hear this mantra, this rap song that's played over again. And it says, I will travel across the land searching far and wide each Pokemon to understand the power that's inside. And then it's enchanted to them. Gotta catch them all. Over and over and over and over again. You know what it does? It fuels your child's craving for more cards, more books, more videos, more movies. It's designed to do that. That's what we call enchanting. Here's the next character. This is Misty. Look at this. Now, this is off of a comic book. This is actually a page of a comic book. But if this was clear, if this was actually clear, you'd see that that's a halter top. It stops right there. And she's got short shorts on. And you know she's got to be about the same age as what Ash is. Okay? And she's described as Ash's companion. And listen to what it says about her. She's headstrong and stubborn, constantly arguing with Ash. Typical woman. No, just, just kidding. <laughs> God forgive me. All right. <laughs> Frivolous spirit. That's what it was. And here's Brock over here in the corner. And Brock is by far the most hormonal. Because his fascination with the opposite sex many times gets him or the group in trouble. Well, then there's Pokemon trainer Gary. And Gary's not pictured in here, but Gary is a real self-centered jerk. He's vindictive and he's obnoxious. And then there are two characters, and one's called Jesse, and the other one's called James. And listen to what it says about them. It says, prepare for trouble, make it double. Jesse and James are an evil gang looking to steal rare Pokemon. Jesse and James are stuck up, fashion conscious. And you know what? In the program... They're also prone to cross-dressing. Now, if you don't know what that means, that means that if you feel like you're a woman in a man's body, you wear women's clothing. You dress like one. 
If you're a woman who feels manly, you wear men's underclothing and dress like one. Cross-dressing. Oh, what kind of role model would that be? Okay, now remember at the first, I think that's enough right here, because I think we've got a pretty well good establishment on this thing. Remember that I said that if the characters were the kind of role models that established the kind of values, standards, and morals that we wanted our kids to have when they got to be an adult, that this game or this particular thing is okay. Remember we said that? Okay, so let's examine what we got. Let's see. Uh, headstrong, stubborn, quibbling, self-centered, vindictive, obnoxious, hormonal, sexually preoccupied, evil, thieving, cross-dressing jerks. No. I don't know about you, but I mean, even if I wasn't a Christian parent, I wouldn't want my kids to grow up with those kind of traits. Then we have to actually say that the characters of this game don't biblically stand up, do they? In other words, they don't represent the kind of values and standards we want our kids to have. And they're definitely not the role models we want our kids to be. But these are the characters that our children are identifying with day after day after day playing this game, watching the cartoon, reading the books, looking at the videos. Now we're also told that these actual beings have supernatural abilities. In other words, they can evolve and grow into bigger and better monsters. Now, this is a scene, actually this is a poster from the movie. And look here, this is Mew, two, this is Mew over here, M-E-U, he's kind of cute. And this is Mew 2 over here, complete with his satanic salute. And if you notice, that pose is always given with the left hand. That's significant. Remember the left hand path? And we're told that they get bigger and better. Of course, that's what we always want. Bigger and better monsters, that's what the world needs. And we're told that they get bigger and better through the use of energy. Now, a funny thing happened. Well, it actually wasn't funny, but an interesting thing happened when this movie, the Pokemon, was actually first released in Japan. I want you to see it. This is from CNN. Look at this. because this is very highly unusual. Japanese cartoon triggers seizures in hundreds of children. And look at this. This is Tokyo, December 17th, 1997. This is when the movie was first actually released over in Japan. The bright flashing lights of a popular TV cartoon became a serious matter Tuesday evening when they triggered seizures in hundreds of Japanese children. In a national survey, the Tokyo Fire Department found that at least 618 children had suffered convulsions, vomiting, irritated eyes, and other symptoms after watching Pokemon. Japanese television network NHK reported that 111 people were still hospitalized Wednesday morning. And now spokesman Hiroshi Uramoto said that a later broadcast of the show scheduled for 30 other stations nationwide had been canceled and that an investigation was well underway. We are shocked to hear many children were taken to hospitals, Uramoto said. We will investigate thoroughly and consult with experts. And you know what they found? Not one of those children had a history of epilepsy. Now, you know, working in the mental health field for as long as I did, I can tell you that bright flashing lights will trigger off in several, uh, in occasion, seizures and convulsions in kids or even adults that are prone to be epileptic. But not in a hundred and so kids who have no seizure problem and no epileptic history. There's something unusual about that. And they went through, and it goes on further to say that they went through and even did CAT scans. And the whole premise was that at the end, they had to conclude that they don't know why it happened. Is that by coincidence? Or did something happen that they can't explain? Remember I said that they get their energy through energy balls. And here is a picture of little cute little Pikachu and he's being energized by an energy ball. And now you notice he's not quite so cute anymore and his little satanic tail is really erect. And now parents, if you're not up on Pokemon, you need to be. 
And one of the things you can do is go out and buy the official Pokemon trading card game player's guide. And you can get this at any store that sells any of the Pokemon stuff. I mean anything. Uh, you can get it like at uh, uh, Toys R Us or any of those places that sell any of the Pokemon. And it says on the back of this, catch them all, then build an un unbeatable tournament deck. And one of the things you can do is look through here because it shows every Pokemon in existence. And it tells you what their powers are. And it tells you how they get weak. And it tells you how they energize and what you need to energize them. But something very unusual is also in this book. And that is that they actually show the energy balls that, that is used to make these monsters bigger and better. I want you to see them. I hope you can see them from where, where I am. Um, I'm going to hold it out here so hopefully you can see it. Look at the yellow. What do you see? Lightning bolt. Lightning bolt. Look here. All seeing eye. Everybody see that? Up here is the clenched fist. Symbol for rebellion, anarchy. Yes. Right down here is a powerful witchcraft symbol where my finger is. Powerful witchcraft symbol, and it's a symbol for fire. Down here is another powerful witchcraft symbol. Actually a new age symbol. They call a new age symbol for earth. Okay, which is a green relief. And down at the bottom here, this blue ball down in here, is the symbol for energy of water. And water transforms into wind. Earth, wind, and fire, the three basic elements of all witchcraft. And I'm going to ask you parents, grandparents, concerned aunt and uncles, friends, do you think they put that in there by coincidence? Do you think they just built this game, put these on there, and said, hey, let's just put those symbols on there. They look cool. Kids won't know what they are, but they'll like them because they look cool. Or did they put them on there because they know what the meaning of each one of those symbols is? And they want to desensitize our children to seeing those symbols so much that when they see them in other things, hey, no big deal. There is a devised plan going on for the battle of our children's minds. There's a war going on right now for the children because Satan wants them really bad. Who better to serve the Antichrist than the youth? And the whole object is to catch them while they're young. Remember the old, remember the, the Pokemon motto? Gotta catch them all? Who do you think feels that way? It's the enemy. Gotta catch them all. Got to get them while they're young. Got to induct satanic doctrine. Got to put these symbols in their spirits. Got to put these monsters in their heads. Got to mess up their dreams. Got to mess up their reality. Got to break up the family. Have you ever tried to get a, 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 talking to a child when he's into this game? It's impossible. They spend more time on this Pokemon. And you know what? It's amazing that your child can tell you every Pokemon in existence, even tell you where they get their power, what they do, and how they do it, but they can't tell you what you told them five minutes ago. They also can't tell you probably what they learned in school that day. And even worse than that, they can't quote you scripture. There's something wrong. And I'm talking to the men right now because, you know, men, we've been given an awesome task by God. We have nothing to say about it. You know why? God tells us that we're the priest of our homes. Yes. We are the ones who say we are going to follow God. I don't care what anyone else does, but as for me and my family, we are going to serve the Lord. Yes. We are the ones who are supposed to say this stuff is going to be allowed and this stuff is out. And ladies... Women of God, you've got an awesome task ahead too because the Word of God says that you're to raise your children in the ways of the Lord. Not in the ways of these Pokemon, not in the ways of witchcraft or Satan worship, but in the ways of the Lord. Are we doing that? Or are we subtly giving in?
This is a picture from one of the comic books. Look at this. Pokemon Psychic Surprise. <laughs> Surprise, all right. Look at this. This creature right here is called Haunter. And I talked to three kids in three different cities who actually came up and told me that they were having bad dreams and that creature was in their dreams. Called Haunter. That makes sense. Haunt. Right up here is a creature that's not quite so cute now. This over here is not quite so cute. Little Pikachu down here, he's crying his eyes out. He's not cute, and even Ash doesn't look cute anymore. Psychic surprise. And you know, going back to those energy balls, I believe that those energy balls represent that the Pokemon get their power by supernatural occult ability. You saw the symbols. Remember, the material speak for itself. They give themselves away. And what made that even more evident was two cards. One was called Abra, and the other called is called is called Kadabra. Abra, Kadabra. And that's an actual phrase, it's an actual name. Listen to this, Webster's Dictionary defines it as a word supposed to have magic powers and hence used in incantations on amulets, etc. a magic spell or formula. And on the Abra card it says, using its ability to read minds, it will identify impending danger and teleport the user to safety. The Kadabra character has a pentagram on his forehead and he has SSS across his chest and it is the satanic SSS and in my particular sect of Satanism we didn't have it but I ran into other groups that did they had tattoos on the inside of their wrist over their breasts or on the inside of their thigh and it was that same SSS you know what it stands for Satan's solemn servant and also, the Kadabra character is always pictured on the card with his left hand giving the satanic salute. And again, I have to ask you, do you think that's on there by coincidence? Do you think they just made this game and said, hey, let's just throw that in there because it looks good? Let's just throw that in there because it makes it look a little more exciting. Or did they put that in there because they know exactly what it means and they want our children to get desensitized to it? They want our children to be able to look at that and actually at one day now, while they're identifying with their favorite Pokemon, reach up and go, hail Pokemon! And what are they actually hailing? Satan. Listen, our kids are carrying around these cards like they're magic symbols. And they are taught to believe that they can call on the powers of these cards anytime they want to. And I ask you, do you believe that our kids believe they have power? Or do you think that, they, that it's just, this is just nothing but talk? Because if they don't believe that it has power, why are we seeing time after time after time news clips about our kids beating each other up on school grounds, even stabbing each other over Pokemon cards? Look at this. Quebec teen stabbed at school over Pokemon cards. This was in Montreal. And this was a 12-year-old student that tried to help his younger brother after his younger brother had his Pokemon card deck stolen from him. And he went over to these young men to get the cards back, and one of the boys pulled out a four-inch knife and stabbed him with it. Look at this. Boy attacks teacher over Pokemon. Here in Lakeland, Florida, there was a young boy who had a, who had a deck of Pokemon cards, and he was passing them around the class, and the, the woman teacher noticed that they were paying more attention to Pokemon than they were her. So she waited for the deck to get back to this young man, and then she walked over and grabbed that deck out of his hand. He got up and struck her dead in the face with his fists. And he, of course, he got called in on the principal's uh, carpet on, in the office, and they called for the parents. The parents came to pick him up, and you know what he told his father? They were trying to steal my powers. Our kids are taught to believe that these things actually have supernatural ability, and that they can call on them anytime they want to because their material states that. In this book, it tells your child, you have the power at your fingertips, so use it. And that's what they're doing. 
this game is a war designed to attack our children's minds, their very character. And if it gets into our homes, it will wreck family life in one way, shape, or form. This stuff is nothing more than unadulterated witchcraft, and it's put in a child's form, designed to attack the child and the parents and the entire family that this thing is associated with. That's exactly what it's designed to do, and that's what it does. Pokemon is a step to bigger and better things in the occult. And I have to wonder sometime it, when a, a, a grade school child is going to do what the Weeping Bell Razor Leaf Pokemon card says. It says this. It spits out poison powder to immobilize the enemy and then finishes the enemy with a spray of acid. And these cards cost anywhere from $7 to $9 per single pack. And there are report after report of children going into their parents' pocketbook and stealing money to go out and buy these cards. What is the purpose? What is the magic that's behind the whole game of Pokemon? I think by looking at it in that realm and looking at it the way that we've looked at it, I don't see it as being something that is beneficial to our children. I don't see it as being something that's going to help our family grow. And I sure don't see it as something that's going to help get the child established in the ways of the Lord. This is totally the opposite. Remember that the whole goal in all of these role-playing games, and especially in Pokemon, is to become the master. Now, what do we do about it? Well, first of all, if you have played with some of these things, if you've dabbled in the occult, and frankly, most people have at one point in their life, then what you have done is opened a spiritual door for the devil to come in and tear you up, and some of the minor things are uh, just the nightmares, and it gets far more serious. So what you have to do, folks, is close those spiritual doors. And there's only one power in the universe that is greater than Lucifer, and that is Jesus Christ, because all power in heaven and earth has been given to him. So if you want to close those spiritual doors, you have to call on him. So let's take just a minute, and I'm going to do th two things tonight and do a little bit different. By the way, before I go any further, this is tape one of two. And tomorrow night he'll be doing the second part. So if you've enjoyed this, there's more coming in tape two. But anyway, we're going to lead each person in here. We're going to all go through a prayer, renouncing all of these things. And then I'm going to explain to you how to receive the real spirit, the spirit that has all power in heaven and earth. So let's all bow our heads, no one looking around, and let's all pray it together. Just to make certain we've closed all of those doors. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask your forgiveness for dabbling in the occult. And Lord, you know what it is that I have played with, that I was uh, serious or not serious about. And Lord, I ask you to forgive me, that you would break those curses, that you would loose those assignments, that you would break those cords, that you would close those doors that I opened, and you would wash them in the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now the second thing we have to do, once we get the doors closed, and if you just prayed that prayer a minute, then that closed the doors. The next thing you have to do is to make certain of two more things. One is that your name is written in the book of life. Those people that get to go to heaven when they die. And the second thing, so that you're clean enough so you can be protected in the trouble ahead. Because, folks, sometime between now and the millennium, we've got to go through Revelation. And we, we've got to go through that, and hopefully we're going to have God's protection. And he says that he'll give it to us, and I believe him. So, how do we get our name written in the book of life? Well, first of all, we have to understand that we're all sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all have come short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. The next thing we have to understand is we cannot earn it. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 say, For it is by grace you are saved through faith. 
and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right, if this eternal life is a gift, then how do we reach out and take that gift? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now what's that saying? That's saying it's not enough to say it and not believe it. It's not enough to believe it and not say it. You've got to say it and you have to believe it. Then Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. In other words, the washing away of your sins, the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But the first question is, what is repent? It means we have to turn from the things of the occult. We have to turn from the potty mouth. We have to turn from the sin. We have to turn from the drinking and the smoking and the carousing and all the other things that the devil has got us in. We have to walk away from those. And we have to walk toward holiness. Holy Spirit, I ask you to knock on the hearts of those people in the audience and those people watching on videotape that they would not put this off, that they would make that decision tonight in G Jesus' name. Now let's all bow, bow our head, and now we're going to ask Jesus to come into our heart so we get to live in eternity with him forever. Let's bow our head, no one looking around. Let's pray it together. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive my sins. Write my name in the book of life, and I believe in my heart, and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross, arose three days later. I ask you to protect me in the day of trouble and keep me holy. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, it's not over in another way because Matthew 10.32 and 10.33 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. And you don't want Jesus denying you. When you stand up in front of those pearly gates and he says, Why should I let you into my heaven? You want to have the answer. And the answer is because you're my Lord and Savior. And you want to be able to say that in front of a group of people. So, if you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, first time you ever asked Jesus into your heart, just raise your hand. The Prophecy Club, a nationwide television program, a nationwide radio program. The Prophecy Club also hosts approximately 40 major city meetings per month. Our mission is to inform Christians of current events that confirm Bible prophecy. Expose the evil devices of Satan. Warn believers what is coming to America. Challenge people to stop sinning and turn to Jesus with all their heart. And to provide a platform for Christian speakers to be heard. It's a bald-faced lie. Using the positions of power and authority in our own government. The greatest oil field in the world is at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. He said, son! You must warn this nation. And now your host for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson. Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. This is going to be tape two out of a two of two tape. In other words, last night we made tape one. 
tonight. This is going to be tape two in the double set series. And the title of this video set is The Occult in Your Living Room. And our speaker tonight is going to be talking about how he was an ex-Satanist high priest. He will expose the subtle devices used to lure people into witchcraft and Satanism. He says that he can take an average size box and walk through most Christians' homes and fill it with occult and satanic materials that they've collected and don't even realize that they are. He gives you his opinion about the evil behind uh, the Ouija board, astrology, tarot cards, psychics, movies, video games, Teletubbies, Pokemon, Pokemon, and a whole bunch more. You'll discover the evil behind symbols you see every day. Will you help me welcome Stephen Dollins? Thank you. We're going we're gonna to continue to carry on our, our research and our study and look at how the United Satanic Front has been actually getting our, our children inducted into Satanism and, and uh, witchcraft worship. And remember that we covered in uh, the last session, we covered in uh, a lot of the things about Pokemon, and we saw that a lot of things in Pokemon we also saw in witchcraft. Now we're going to look at a subject that covers paganism, and it's in the form of a, t of a toddler's show, and it's called Teletubbies. Now, the sound, when, it said, when, the, when the children hear this sound on TV, it's time for Teletubbies, it's time for Teletubbies. Hundreds, literally hundreds of toddlers run to their television set, and they plop down in front of that TV set to watch one hour of four roly-poly creatures go through their everyday routines. And, you know, one of the things that I did is I actually sat there and, and well, I had to actually make myself watch it, but I actually sat there and watched about four or five of these shows. And the thing that appeared to me the most and, and really stuck out the most in my mind was this one thing. There were no mommy and daddy Teletubbies in the movie, in, in the program. They're never presented that way. In fact, we're told that these are babies, high-tech babies. Now, remember that I told you that it doesn't make any difference what I say. It's what their own material says. Well, I brought with me tonight a, a, actually a, a statement by Ann Wood, and this is their creator at British Broadcasting Company, because this thing started out as being a BBC production, British Broadcasting Company, and then America picked it up with PBS and put, started putting it on TV, PBS. And Ann Wood says this, they are babies, technological babies. Like children, they also imitate what they hear, so they will attempt to speak like the narrator and sometimes like the voice trumpets. The Teletubby world is, a, is a full of pretty flowers, rabbits, warm hugs, and high-tech marbles, but it's also completely void of parental guidance. And the one thing that's the mystery about the whole show is that your toddler sits in front of the TV watching these roly-poly creatures that look like aliens. And the whole mystery is to find out or to try to figure out which one of the Teletubbies television screens, because that's why they're called Teletubbies. They have a television screen in their stomach. Which one of those Teletubby creatures will actually be the one that a clip about children will actually show on that television screen? And you notice one thing that you'll see is if you'll watch that program that every one of those clips are about children. No parents in those clips either. So what are they actually saying? Well, when you look at the program, it looks innocent enough. But I want to point out something to you. I want to point out a couple of things here first before we get started. Number one, the most prevalent actual character in that program is a baby-faced son. And I mean this son actually has an animated baby's face. And every time that the Teletubbies do something that the son likes, it'll smile at them, grin, giggle. But every time that they do something that it doesn't like, it'll frown at them as if it's really getting angry. And it seems to put fear in the Teletubbies. At some points in the, in the, in the uh, program, the Teletubbies will even rebel, and the son gets really angry. And also, around the sun, it starts to really glow. In other words, like the, the flames around that sun start to get hotter, as if he's really getting mad and angry. The other thing is that out of the ground comes what's called a voice trumpet. In other words, this trumpet comes up out of the ground. It's actually a voice horn. 
that comes up out of the ground, and it announces everything that the Teletubbies are to do. It's time to play. It's time to eat. It's time to sleep. It's time to go. Everything that they do is announced and directed by that voice trumpet. Not a mother and dad. Not grandparents. Not aunts and uncles. No parental guidance whatsoever. But yet we're told that these are babies. Remember Ann Wood said these are high-tech babies. And, and the Andy Davenport, he's a scriptwriter for this program, says this. Children are the same the world over. They grow. They learn language. They learn to talk, to think the same, wherever they grow up. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't particularly believe that particular statement. And the reason for that is, if I don't want my child believing the same thing that another child believes in another country, if they're serving a different God, or if they're going against parental authority, or if they're going against any kind of uh, uh, guidance whatsoever, I don't want my child thinking the same as that child. She also goes on to say that we have to quit bogging down our children with values and morals and standards to the point to where they don't understand or that they feel out of place. Now, these characters are actually actors in costumes. And they are taught to walk like toddlers, talk like toddlers, play like toddlers, even eat like toddlers, so that your toddler watching them will identify with them. And so everything that they watch these Teletubby toddlers do, now that becomes their role model, and they try to imitate that. And I don't know if you, if you have children that watch Teletubbies or not, but I mean, when they're glued to that TV set, you can talk to them. They don't hear a word you're saying. It's almost like they're mesmerized. That's their favorite one. You hear them giggle and laugh and everything else, and mom and dad sit there and go, oh, that's such a good program because, you know, it keeps my child uh, uh, entertained. Sure, it's entertainment, but don't we know that witchcraft is also entertaining? And lovable alien-like creatures, now these are played again by real people, and Teletubbies, in Teletubby land, everything is supplied for them. Not by moms and dads, grandparents, aunts and uncles. Everything is supplied by them by this baby-faced son and by this voice trumpet. In fact, they have uh, Teletubby custard, they have Teletubby toast, and there's even a, a comical vacuum cleaner named Nunu. And it goes around and, and makes the Teletubbies laugh. And so it looks real innocent. And the Teletubbies may be fantasy creatures in a fantasy world, but young toddlers pick up everything that they do. In other words, they watch that and they identify with that. And in his book, All of Our Children Learning, Dr. Benjamin Bloom, the father of outcome-based education, states this. The purpose of education in the schools is to change the thoughts, feelings, and actions of students. Now think about that for a minute. Just stop and think about what that statement just said. Now let's turn that around and listen to what it says to you individually. The purpose of education and the schools is to change the thoughts, feelings, and actions of my child. Where are those thoughts and actions supposed to be changed? At home, not the schools. We don't want the schools changing the thoughts and feelings of, of our children. That's what makes them special. That's what makes them unique. You know, I don't want school, I don't want my, my child to come home and say, oh, I can't laugh anymore because I learned in school that's against, that's against authority. You know, that sort of thing. So we, I don't want the schools, and I'm sure you don't want the schools, actually taking over and doing that. But how many know that that's exactly what the school system has done? In fact, uh, a book we're going to talk about a little later, Harry Potter, there are many, many schools who are now requiring that for required reading in elementary schools. And it's nothing more than unadulterated witchcraft. So when we look at this thing, again, on the surface, it looks real enticing because it's, it's entertaining. And the Teletubby world is the best attempt to, to uh, touch preschoolers with the seeds of this new age ide ideology. Because now you start to see that we have man-made gods because we have the sun. Okay, and in any pagan culture, the sun has always been worshipped as a god. And example, winter solstice on December 19, 1991. Now, I actually have the, the, uh, the uh, pamphlet that they sent out, and here's what it is. And on December 19, 1991, a public elementary school in Portland, Oregon, 
replaced their traditional Christmas party with the Solstice Festival, and here's what their printed program was entitled, Celebrate the Return of the Light. And it pictured the sun god and the moon goddess. Who is the moon goddess? We talked about that the last session, Diana. She's the, she's the goddess of the moon, and she's the highest witchcraft god. Okay? And it said, pictured the sun god and the moon goddess, and here's what the events read. Listen to this. Each student will partake of the sun and moon cake before entering the auditorium, where they will seat themselves according to their astrological signs. Chanting will begin. Then it goes on to say, the sun god and moon goddess will enter with attendants, and then dancers and drummers will enter. Barcode children and animal spirits. Now you can only, I only leave that to your imagination as to what that barcode children are. And then he says, it goes on, and the last one on there, it says, dancing in a circle together, feel free to hoop and holler. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that's pagan occult. And all the symbols that they have in there, the sun, the moon, those are all pagan symbols, and those are all occult symbols. We, we examined that. So we need to examine the official description of each Teletubby to find out exactly where it is. Now, first we're going to look at, this is Poe. Okay, on the screen here. This is Poe, and it's the smallest Teletubby. And this is a girl. And she often jumps, and she, she jumps up and down to express her feelings of joy and enthusiasm and surprise. And the natural place for her to be is on her scooter going over the hills. So this is Poe, and she also makes a noise. She'll say quickly, 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 or slowly, slowly, slowly. And she also spends a lot of time on her own again, away from parental authority or any kind of guidance from, from parents, okay? So, first of all, this is Poe. Now, I want you to notice that each Teletubby, remember we said that each Teletubby has a screen on their stomach, a television screen. Well, in order for you to be able to show a clip or for them to be able to show any kind of an image on that television screen, there has to be a receiver. And so, the antenna on top of the head becomes that receiver. And isn't it odd that each one of these Teletubbies have a different antenna? In fact, my question was, why don't they all have the same antenna? In other words, if these are all babies, they all come from the same place, and they all seem to be basically in a Teletubby family, all of their own, then why don't they have the same, why don't they have the, the same antenna? Why are all those antennas different? Now, these symbols are simple shapes. But if you'll also remember, in the last session, we said that the circle represented the female womb. And in pagan cultures, it's also a powerful symbol of female serpentine power. In other words, fertility. And you notice on there that it also it symbolizes a spiritized mother goddess because that's also in paganism referred to as the earth, symboling, symbolizing the earth. And to contemporary pagans and radical feminists, it's one of the primary feminine signs. So that's Poe, the littlest one and the one with the antenna with the circle. Now keep that one in mind. The next we're going to look at is called Dipsy. We'll go back to that one. This is Dipsy. And now you'll notice that Dipsy has a different antenna, and I'm going to pull that down just a little bit so you can see the top of that. And you'll notice that when it comes up, it doesn't come up to a fine point, and it doesn't come up and round off. It comes up here, comes into a curve, and then rounds off, rounds off again, clearly a phallic symbol. If you'll look at that real close, you'll see the phallic symbol. It looks like a phallus. And in every pagan culture, the rod has always represented a phallus. And, and that is a powerful symbol for male fertility. Pagan cultures, even, even on the, uh, the Celtic fertility symbols, uh, they have a holiday called Beltane and a May Day, the Maypole, symbolized by male power. That's exactly what this represents. Now, the interesting thing about uh, Dipsy is that when you start to look at it, 
This is the second biggest Teletubby, and he's also known for his distinctive steps and way of saying hello. So again, now this is going to really appeal to your toddler. Dipsy, Poe. Then we look at the third one. And this is Lala. And if you look at Lala, this is the second smallest Teletubby. And she's by far the happiest and the most smiley of all the Teletubbies. And she loves to dance. And she loves to sing. And her favorite word is nice. But now, we start to look at the antenna on Lala, and look what's happened. Here we have the male symbol, or I'm sorry, the female symbol of the circle, and it doesn't just break off and, and go separate, it goes from the female symbol right into the male phallic symbol. So you'll look at that, and you see as it comes up, it curves around, forms the circle, and then comes up and forms the rod. And now again at the top, when you see this, you can see clearly that it looks like a phallus. Then we have, we come to the, to the last one, the fourth one, and the fourth one is the most interesting of all. And you don't know how hard it is to say the names of these little things, because I mean I had to sit there and watch these things. Okay, so this is Tinky Winky. I said it. Okay, Tinky Winky. <laughs> and he's by far the most biggest Teletubby, and he's the gentlest of the Teletubbies. In fact, he's so gentle, he has everything in a bag. And, you know, the one thing that I noticed about, and in the, in the episode that I watched on this, he loves wearing a smaller little white ballet skirt. And he loves to dance in a white tutu or ballet skirt. And I looked at that and I said, what in the world is that supposed to represent? And then it dawned on me because I looked up here and I saw this antenna. Remember that when we saw in the last session, we looked at the occult symbols, we looked at the pagan symbols, and we said the triangle was a representation of earth, wind, and fire, the basic elements of all witchcraft. We also said that it was a powerful spell casting symbol. But if you notice this now, we have a triangle that's pointing down, and the triangle is in multiple forms. And it's pictured in, in alchemy as a sexual rite. In fact, in Buddhism, it's referred to as a sex sign. And isn't it strange that the gay and lesbian community have now taken the upside down triangle as their logo, their symbol. And they've also adopted the color purple, which is the color that Tinky Winky is. And then it dawned on me, that's why he dances in a ballet skirt. I know it sounds funny, but I mean, you look at this thing, and you know, it looks real innocent, but when you look at it, on the, sur I mean, you know, on the surface, it looks really fun, and it looks really, you know, like, oh, there's nothing wrong with them, they're just cute. But when you look underneath of what they're really trying to say, Marilyn Ferguson, the author of The Aquarian Conspiracy, a, a New World Order blueprint for changing people's perception, she states this, listen to this, in order to teach children of tomorrow a new perception of reality, we must make symbols and their evolving and politically correct meanings more fun and familiar than the home-taught words, values, and meanings. And so now what they're saying is they're teaching your toddler through symbols. And if you go even further, Andy Davenport, the scriptwriter, goes further to say that we've been bogging down our toddlers and our young people with all these values and morals and standards for too long, making them feel out of place if they're in a different environment. And then he goes on to state what that different environment is. Listen to this. He says that if a child grows up in a home where mom is a woman and dad is a another woman, that we should teach them that it's okay. And if a child grows up in a home where dad is a man and mom is another man, that it's okay. That we can't let them feel out of place. That we have to teach them that this is a different symbol and that 
everything is the way it should be and that that kind of value and that kind of standard should be looked at as being acceptable and okay. And so what is the true message behind Teletubbies, these roly-poly creatures that our toddlers watch? That gay is okay. Now we start to see that these things are taken on a different light. Now we start to see that they have actually found a way to make evil look cute and take God's principles and make them look ridiculous. And that's what they're trying to portray to our toddlers. So the next time your toddler sits in front watching, watching Teletubbies, remember that there's a message being portrayed to him, him or her, and it's not a good one. Remember that the message is gay is okay. And lifestyle learning back in 1973, this life, lifelong process of socialization, they said it would start soon after birth with community training sessions for parents, and then they're supposed to teach the parents how to teach their, their children. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to go to a class where I feel like if I'm a parent, I don't need to go to a class for somebody to teach me how to be a parent. And I know a lot of parents out there don't feel that way either. But this is this new schooling that's coming about. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it's on the rise. Because if you don't think that witchcraft, paganism, and Satanism is on the rise, you need to open up your eyes. I believe, and this is my own opinion, but I believe that the New Age religion, or the new religion when the Antichrist comes into power, is not going to be a New Age movement at all. In fact, it's not even going to be a worship back of nature. I believe that the new religion is going to be the old religion, and it's going to be prevalent upon the earth, and it's going to be nothing more than return to witchcraft, the practice of magic and symbols. Because, see, we're all, we're all grounded in symbols. Now, I've seen witchcraft packaged in many different ways, but never so cleverly as this one. This is Harry Potter. And this is the book right here. And this is the first book that was out. Now, Harry Potter, actually this is a craze that came out just before this last Christmas. In fact, just before Christmas 1999. And it amazed me that I was seeing more reports that children were asking for this book and the series in this book more than they were asking for toys. And I thought, that's kind of unusual. Because here, the Christmas before, the biggest thing was what? Furbies. Everybody had to have one. Okay? They have one time, you know, it's, you know how Christmas goes. One time it might be Power Rangers, and your, your child has to have one because everybody's got one. And then there might be Pokemon because every other, every other kid's got one now. And now uh, it's gone to Harry Potter. And what we need to do is we need to look at Harry Potter because I want to tell you something. This is nothing more than unadulterated witchcraft put in the form of a child's book. And if your child reads this book, he is receiving a curse. And if you read this book to your child, he or she is receiving a curse. Because I want to tell you something. The spells that are in this book are very real spells. They're not something somebody came up with. This is written actually by a British authoress named J.K. Rowling. And J.K. Rowling is a professed witch in England. She wrote this, these books and she said that she sees things through her mind's eye and how many know that's a new age concept? Remember about supposedly having a psychic eye in the middle of your forehead and you're supposed to be able to see into the psychic world and receive all kinds of um, uh, information and things of supernatural ability to be able to, to share those things with others through your mind's eye. She says she sees things through her mind's eye and then writes them down and that's how she came up with this book and this character, Harry Potter. Now, she also goes on to say that she was going to actually write four books and then stop. She actually had the plan for four books. But then she said that she had such a popularity rise in the books of Harry Potter when the very first one came out that she said that she decided to do a seven-book series. 
And there are three books now that have been released and are actually published and out on the market right now. And there are four more to come. And now I re just read just a, about a week ago in, an, in, a, in a magazine, she, st she was doing an interview with a magazine, in fact it was Life magazine, she said that the four to come were going to be even darker than the first. So there's four more to come, praise God, we're always looking for them, aren't we? Now, the interesting thing about this is, is if you go into bookstores looking for Harry Potter, good luck. Because most of the time, they're sold out. They're that popular. And what we need to do is we need to look at Harry Potter and see exactly what this is. So let's examine Harry Potter and the story of Harry Potter. Now, this is actually the second cover of the book. What you're seeing up here, this book is actually the first cover that was printed in the United States. But the first cover, the actual first cover was actually printed in England. And what they did was they actually changed the cover because the British people were putting up an uproar and they said that they didn't want that cover on their, on their book because these right here where you see the diamond shapes were actually pentagrams. And so there was something about that that allowed the British people to see that there was something wrong about it. The other thing is that the very first book was called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. And then all of a sudden they changed it to Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And now if you'll look at there, you'll see all kinds of symbology. Take a look at Harry Potter and you'll see the lightning bolt in the P. And we also stated in the last session that the lightning bolt was a symbol of Satan. Okay? So Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And now you see, over in this corner, here are demon dogs. Over down in here is a unicorn. There are several symbols, because if you'll look closely in those pillars, if you could actually see them close up, you'll see faces in those pillars. And at the top here, okay, there's your triangles, and they've even got the triangles into here. And Harry is riding on a broomstick. And the premise of the story is this. Harry Potter is a boy who's a 12-year-old who his parents are killed in a car accident. And Harry survives that car accident. He was with his parents at a very, very, very young age. And now he's uh, an orphan, and he's sent over to England to live with his aunt and uncle, who are horrible to him. In fact, they treat him like a nobody. Well, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to read for you right off the book itself, because that, that'll, that'll help support what it is. Listen to this. Harry Potter has never played a sport while flying on a broomstick. He's never worn a cloak of invisibility, befriended a giant, or helped hatch a dragon. All Harry knows is a miserable life with the Dursleys his horrible aunt and uncle, and their abominable son, Dudley. Harry's room is a tiny closet at the foot of the stairs, and he hasn't had a birthday party in 11 years. But all that is about to change when a mysterious letter arrives, a letter with an invitation to a wonderful place he never dreamed existed. There he finds not only friends, aerial sports, and magic around every corner, but a great destiny that's been awaiting him, if Harry can survive the encounter. Now, Harry is a nobody. He's living with his aunt and uncle, the, the Dursleys, and they have an abominable son named Dudley. And he, Dudley treats him like he's an outcast, doesn't accept him in part of the family at all. But Harry knows there's something about him that's very special. And he receives an invitation in the book. He receives an invitation by a giant that comes knocking on the door one day. And Harry opens up the door, and the giant has a message for him in the form of a letter. And you know what? It's an invitation that he joined something. You know what that is? Hogwarts School of Wizardry and Witchcraft. And so Harry thinks, gee, why did I receive this invitation? I must be important. I must be special. And so Harry runs off from his aunt and uncle's home. He jumps aboard a train, and he goes to Hogwarts School of Wizardry and Witchcraft where he learns how to cast spells, how to summon spirits, how to do hexes, 
how to form symbols. And you know what? So does your child. Because as I said before, the things that are in this book are in actual witchcraft books. This is in the form of a children's book. And you know what gives Harry his specialty? Harry was born, he was special, and he wonders why he receives that invitation. And Hogwarts begins to tell him why he was so special enough to receive the invitation to join his school. He tells Harry that Harry was in that accident, and that accident, by the way, the, the, the uh, accident that killed his parents was a form of a lightning bolt coming down and destroying the car that they were in, blowing it up. But Harry survived. But he was also born and received from that accident a particular scar on his forehead. Look here. That's the scar right there on his forehead. Do you know what it is? A purple lightning bolt on his forehead. So now that's what makes him special because with Harry's purple scar on his head, he now has psychic abilities and he's able to do things that other people aren't able to do. And he knows things that other people shouldn't know. He knew things before, but he didn't know why. Now he's, now he's seen as very special. And you notice how that appeals to the child, because now the child begins to identify with Harry. How, how often is some, you know, you talk about a child, and how often has a child mentioned about, gee, I just want to run away. Mom and Dad have strict rules, too. I just want to run away. So he starts associating with Harry because they can identify with that. And it makes it look as if, if you want to be a somebody, you can be just like Harry Potter. You can become a wizard too. There are a lot of books on the market about witchcraft, but I'm telling you, this is the one that's packaged in, in, in the latest form of a children's book. And the thing about it is, is that now, a lot of parents are starting to read these books to their children, and now they're even getting into the story of Harry Potter. I'll tell you a true story. I was on the plane to Dallas. It's kind of a funny story, because, I mean, this is actually true. I, you know, this is actually true. I was at a plane and, and getting ready to leave Dallas to go to Corpus Christi, which was about, I think, about 45 minutes to an hour flight. And it was one of those twin engine planes. And we went out to the bus, I mean, the bus took us out to the plane, and we sat there, and we sat there, and we sat there, and we sat there because there was no crew, and they kept radioing back, we ought to have a crew, somebody needs to fly the plane, we're supposed to leave, oh, we were supposed to leave 30 minutes ago, and they radioed back saying, well, the crew's here, we just don't know where they are, <laughs> true, so the crew's here, we just don't know where they are. So we're starting to, you know, make jokes about, well, I better go look in the bar somewhere. They might be in there. But I looked over, and right away from me, there was, a, there was a lady sitting here, an older lady, and then there was a younger lady, probably in her 20s, that was sitting on the other side of her. And the way they talked, I, I could only gather that, that was her daughter. The younger one was her daughter. But she was sitting there reading this hardback book. And I kept looking at that book because it looked familiar, but I couldn't place it. And I kept trying to get a good look at it, and I couldn't. And so she took it with her on the plane. Finally, the crew came out after about 45 minutes that we were supposed to take off. The crew finally came out, and after we told them, you know, to send them through a breathalyzer, you know, make sure before they got behind the wheel of that plane, you know, we took off, and we got to Corpus Christi, and I still kept, all the way down the flight, I kept trying to get a look at her. She was sitting right in front of me. But the chair was so high, I couldn't, get a, I couldn't get a look at the book. I kept trying to look around, but I, I couldn't get a, a, a good chance at it. And so I said, I bet, I, I said, there's just something about that book that I recognize, but I can't place it. And when we landed in Corpus Christi, she got out, and she got ready to, to, to take off her seatbelt, and she stood up to get her, her things out of the, the overhead uh, storage bin, and she put the book down on the, the uh, seat. So, of course, I raise up and look down, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And it was amazing that somebody of her caliber and somebody of her age would be reading Harry Potter. Because I'm sitting there going, why in the world is she reading Harry Potter? This is a children's book. But again, the mysterious thing about this is, is now parents are starting to get into the story of Harry Potter. Not only are their kids identifying with Harry Potter, 
but the parents are too. And at grieving, I've had, I've had uh, ladies come up and tell me, Christian, Christian uh, women come up and tell me, at about five different cities that I've been to so far on the tour. And I mean, they have tears in their eyes. And I said, what's, what's wrong? And they said, well, you remember when you talked about Harry Potter? And I said, yes. And they said, our children are being required to read that at their school. Required reading. And you sit there and you go, what in the world is going on? Librarians think it's great. Parents think it's great. Because now little Billy, for the first time, is reading a book. Little Sally has never shown any interest in any kind of literature at all. Praise the Lord. She's spending about six hours to eight hours a day reading Harry Potter. Isn't it wonderful? Sure it is. It's witchcraft. It's exciting. And your children begin to identify with Harry. And the darker that it gets in the story, the more they start to identify with Harry. Take a look at the picture again. Look really close and look and see if you see other symbols in here. Now, this is more of a blown up type version of that. On the hardback book, it actually shows the stars even better. I don't know whether the camera can zoom in on that close enough or not. On the hardback book, it actually shows it better. And the stars on this are actually inverted. The stars on this are actually inverted. So what it means is that it shows satanic symbols right there on the cover of the book. And you think that's by coincidence? Absolutely not. They know what they're doing. J.K. Rowling knows what she's doing because remember, she's a professed witch. Here's the second book. It's called Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Now, audience, what has Satan always been symbolized as? Serpent, right? Now, how many see the serpents in the cover on this book? How many see the one wrapped around the pole here? There's one here, one down in this cave, one here coming out. How many see the one in the pole over here? There's the head, there's the eye wrapped around that pole. Here's Harry Potter, bless his heart. Now you can see his purple lightning bolt scar right there on his forehead. It's what gives him his ability, his psychic ability. And Harry is holding on to a phoenix, which is a mythical bird and a big symbol of reincarnation. And you notice it's called, and the chamber of secrets. In this story, now Harry discovers the secret of it all. And listen to what it is. Harry discovers that his parents' murder, because it wasn't an accident at all, his parents' murder was caused by an evil wizard called Lord Voldemort. And Lord Voldemort now is after Harry because Harry is destined to become a very powerful wizard. And Lord Voldemort wants to be the very best powerful wizard. And he hoped at the time when he destroyed his parents, Harry's parents, that he would also destroy Harry too so that he didn't reach his destiny. But now that he finds out that Harry is right there at the school and learning these things and that he's destined to become a very powerful wizard, all Lord Voldemort wants to do now is destroy Harry. And now it becomes exciting. Now your child can't wait for the next book because is Harry going to survive? Is Harry going to find out his destiny? Is he ever going to reach his destiny? What's going to happen to poor Harry? What's going to happen to all the friends that Harry's met? By the way, at the school of Hogwarts wizardry and witchcraft, Harry's friends are all witches and wizards. And in the book, there's a message that goes out to your child. You know what that is? that the witches are the good guys, the parents are the bad guys. Portraying us, and I mean Christian parents, to look like we're a bunch of fools. That we are cruel, and that our rules are too strict, and now Harry is treated with his best family, and his best family now are witches. 
practicing witches. Isn't that amazing? And again, you, now your child begins to really identify with it, and it gets exciting. Now, I want to read to you what she states, meaning J.K. Rowling. Here's what she actually states. In that same interview, here's what she says, and I think this gives it away. She says, the idea that we could have a child who escapes from the confines of the adult world and go somewhere where he has power, both literally and metaphorically, really appealed to me. And you know what? It also appeals to your child. Because how many times has your child, have you, have, have you ever, ever asked your child, am I too strict? Do we have too many rules around here? You know what their first words are going to be. Yes, you do. You know, that's, that's, that's their first reaction. You sure do. And how many of us can identify when we were kids? We all reached that point where we wanted to run away. We, we thought there might be something better. And that starts to really get into your child's psyche, in other words, their mind, and starts to implant an idea. And that idea is that you can be a Harry Potter, you can be important, you can be special, all you need to do is become a wizard. All you need to do is give yourself to the dark side and you can be important too. Now remember I told you there are three books that are out to be published. I understand the fourth one's about to be released. And remember that J.K. Rowling, the authoress, said that the next four to come out are to be even darker than the first three. If that wasn't enough. So that's the second book. Here is the third book that's out. It's called Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. And here is Harry, and here is one of his little friends, and this is a witch, and she's riding on the back there. You see with her pointed hat. Here down in the corner here is Lord, evil Lord Voldemort. This is the one that's out to kill Harry. And Harry is riding upon a griffin which is a mythical bird that's supposed to be half horse, half lion, and half eagle. And again, this is a witchcraft symbol, an occult symbol. And I ask you parents, do you think somebody just came up and said, oh, let's just throw that on there? If they didn't know what it meant. If they didn't know that the whole ideology of this new schooling is to induct our children with symbols. Instead of teaching them with words and morals and values, we're going to teach them with symbols. We're going to teach them to identify with symbols. I want to read to you right here out of the pages of this book, because page after page brings the reader into timeless battle with the forces of good and evil. In fact, Hogwart tells him, Harry, that there is no such thing as good and evil. There's just power. And the amount of that power determines how good you are or how evil you are. Think back to Star Wars. That's the same message. Exactly the same message. Here's from Hogwarts' uh, uh, theology, right from the pages of the first book here, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Listen to this. Here's Professor Snape, and he's the one who teaches potions. And he says this. I don't expect you will really understand the beauty of the softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes, the delicate power of liquids that creep through human veins, bewitching the mind and snaring the senses. A centaur's view on astrology. He says, we have sworn not to set ourselves against the heaven. Have we not read what is to come in the movement of the planets? Or have the planets not let you in on that secret? Once introduced to the occult, the child begins to crave more. That's designed to do that. It's not by accident. It's not by coincidence. It's designed to do that. They easily find it uh, in their neighborhoods and schools, because I'm telling you, every bookstore now you can walk into and ask them if they have Harry Potter. Most of the time they will. But the very first book is the one that's hard to find. You can't find copies of it because parents have bought it, children have bought it, and sadly to say, aunts and uncles and grandparents, I've talked to several of them that have bought that book for their children or grandchildren to read. Can you imagine reading this as a bedtime story? 
And then having your child go to sleep, dreaming about witches and evil Lord Voldemort and wanting to have a lightning bolt on their forehead. And we wonder why our kids have bad dreams. Could it be the stuff we're reading to them or telling them before they go to bed? And you can identify things because now, even in big bookstores, Barnes & Noble, by the way, I was watching on CNN one night, about two weeks before I went on tour. How many of you know, if you watch CNN sometimes, especially late at night, you can pick up some good stuff. And I just happened to watch CNN, and I was watching for, for sports stuff, and they came on and they showed this news clip. And what the news clip was, was talking about Harry Potter and how, how big a phenomenon it was. And they were doing interviews with librarians who were saying that it was just great because now children were taking their time and actually reading material. And one librarian says, I don't care what it is. I don't care what it portrays. I don't care what kind of ideology our children get just as long as they're reading. So in other words, she's saying, I don't care if it's witchcraft. If they're reading it, that's great. And they were doing interviews with parents. And the parents on there said, oh, I think it's just wonderful. My child just never thought about picking up a book before. And we tried to get him or her interested in, this, in books before. And they just were boring. I'm telling you, Harry Potter is not boring. To them, it is not boring. It must not be boring to parents, too, if many parents are starting to read it. And it's fascinating. And on this same clip, they actually showed a Barnes & Noble bookstore. And they said that outside of this bookstore, they were having a Harry Potter party. Try to say that three times. Harry Potter party. And in this party, you were to come dressed as your favorite character. And they showed the camera going down the line of all these kids standing with their parents outside of this bookstore waiting to get into this party. There was no book signing party. I mean, it, the, the authoress wasn't there. There was no thing special about it except that it was just a Harry Potter party. Something that you could go and, and celebrate your favorite character. And they were all outside dressed in their favorite costumes. And you know what? The most prevalent character of all was Harry. And the way that you could tell that was is that here were hundreds of children, boys and girls, who had painted lightning bolts purple on their foreheads. And we look at it and we say, that's innocent? Oh, that's just a children's book? That's just a story? That's not real? And you know what? We sit there and probably tell our children the same thing. Honey, you don't have to worry. Those people don't exist. That's not real. There's nothing in witchcraft. That's just on TV. See, that's what I thought before I really got into it was that witches were just on TV. And I had to find out for myself. I mean, I was just determined to find out if there was any such thing as witches and any such thing as magic. And that's what got me into deeper and deeper into it until I finally ended up into the darker side of it and got to the highest form, which is Satan worship. Praise God came out of that. And our children are being fascinated and surrounded by peers because peers are now actually giving peer pressure onto our children to get involved in these things. Now, why do I mean by that? Listen, let's say, for instance, your child doesn't have Pokemon, but the boy next door does. Now, he thinks that Pokemon are, is just the greatest thing to come along. And he plays it religiously, okay? And now your son or your daughter is associating with that child, and your, your little two-year-old or three-year-old, four-year-old, however old they are, is now giving peer pressure, getting peer pressure from that other child saying, how come you don't have it? Don't your mom and dad love you? My mom and dad love me. They bought me Pokemon. I wanted Harry Potter. They went out and got me all three books. Your mommy and daddy must not like you. Now what's that plan in your child's head? So now you can understand why they come to you, and for the first time, you're wondering why they're asking you for Pokemon. You're wondering why all of a sudden they're interested in something called Harry Potter. Because they're receiving peer pressure. Other kids are reading it, and they're sharing it. You know, kids love to share information with each other all the time. 
I mean, sometimes you, you have a, a child in the room, you can't get a word in edgewise. You know, and they love to talk, and they love to share things with each other. And uh, if Harry Potter is what they're sharing with each other, that's what they're doing. Harry Potter is nothing more than unadulterated witchcraft in the form of a child's book. That's one of the dangers that are out there right now trying to infiltrate the minds of our children. And they're doing a good job of it because I'm going to tell you something. This is on the bestseller list as the number one children's book. You think about Tom Sawyer and all the stuff that we used to read. Well, I don't know. I'm not going to give my age away, <laughs> hopefully. But you read all the things that we used to read as children, and then you look at the things that our children have in front of them that they have the opportunity to read. And I'm telling you, when you look at that, and you look at that as, as, as you know, the surface of it, and you look underneath that, and you're sitting there going, wait a minute. We never had this when I was a kid. We never had witchcraft books when I was a child. You know, but these things are out there, and that's what they're designed to do, is to get our children interested and inducted into witchcraft and Satanism by making it look fun. And the whole message is, it's fun to be a witch. It's fun to be a wizard. You can be important. You can be to the point to where you don't need mom and dad. You don't need grandparents. You don't need aunts and uncles. You are a master. And as, as we did in the last session, isn't that what everything that we've been studying so far gone to show? Isn't that been the underlying message? The child becomes the master. You're the master, you become the ruler of your home. So now we wonder why our children rebel and why it seems like, my goodness, little Sally just got really obstinate lately. She, everything we tell her is no. And we wonder why. Because they're being taught to say no. They're being taught to rebel against parental authority, that parents aren't needed, that the child can handle it on their own. Now, our children spend about 16 to 24 hours a day playing games. And the most prevalent games that are played are actually referred to as video games, meaning that they play them on the computer or they play them in the arcades. Some of them are funny, some of them are good, and some of them are like this one. Look at this. This one's called Blood Omen Legacy of Cain. Isn't that pretty? And you look up here and it says the epic role-playing game. Remember that we said that in most of these games, the object is role-playing. And I will remind you that role-playing means that the player actually becomes a part of the game. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a child, when I was, even when I was a teenager, we were playing things like uh, space invaders and asteroids and things like that. We didn't have the 3D screens that we have now. And now with the introduction of Nintendo 64 system that was uh, released October 1996 and with uh, the Sega, new Sega Saturn and the brand new and called Dreamcast system, because the Dreamcast system has a really high resolution screen. And what they've actually been able to do with the high technology of video that we have now is they can make fantasy look real. And I'm going to tell you, I sent off, what I did was I actually sent off for promos of these games and played them on my computer. God forgive me. <laughs> but that's how you find out. That's how you know. You have to look for it yourself. And I sent off for these promos, and, and you know, the, the dangerous thing about it is now with the internet system where we can actually have so easy access to websites, there are websites that your child or your teenager can tap into and they can actually get demos of this game and play it right there on their computer. But it's one of those try before you buy type things. And I sent off for some of these and they sent back the disc. It actually came back in a CD-ROM disc. And you actually put it into your computer and then play it. And then what I did was took pictures on my computer. I have a program that I can go in and actually take pictures of the video screen as it's playing. 
So what I'm going to show you now are some of those video screens. And I'm, again, I ask you to ask the Lord to sharpen your discernment so that you see what you think you see in the video screens. Now, first of all, let's look at this first one. This is Blood Omen Legacy of Cain, epic role-playing game. Now, what happens is, in this game, you are a 600,000-year-old vampire. See his teeth? You're a 600,000-year-old vampire. You've been destroyed by the bad townspeople because you've been going around biting their necks and sucking all the blood out of them. Bad townspeople should be slapped. So they go out and kill you, destroy you, and you're in the grave, and all of a sudden, someone comes along with a book of incantations and spells. And there's a reincarnation spell. And that's read over your grave. And so now, guess what? You're back to life. And it's the whole premise of this thing is that now you're the vampire, and you're with your sword and your teeth, and your glaring eyes, you go after the townspeople. This is a game of revenge. And I'm going to read to you right off the back of the box of this thing, because the advertisement alone is enough to see the occult elements. Now, listen to this. Here's what's on the back of the box of this particular game. It says, butcher villagers or turn them into festering pools of decaying flesh with one of 22 demented magics. It will take you more than 100 hours of adventure to destroy all those who damned you, but you'll get them. Every last bloody one. Now, there's a rating system, a mature rating system, just like we have a rating system in movies. Video games have a rating system also. And this game is M17, meaning that those that are under 17 are not supposed to be allowed to buy this particular game. You know what? It doesn't make any difference if your child is 5, 6, or 10. If they have the money in their hands, the clerk will sell it to them. And I hate to say this, but I will tend to believe, and I tend to believe, and I will bet you that 90%, at least 90% of parents don't know what their children bring through the front door of their own home. Because it's easy to go out and buy a CD. It's easy to go out and buy a game or a toy. And they put it in a bag. And they take it upstairs. And they play with it. And praise God, we all work for a living. And you know, your child comes in and wants to talk to you. And mom and dad is too busy working on their, their laptop or their, you know, doing, doing work for the next day. And they say, honey, you know, don't bother mommy or daddy right now. Just go and play with your game. What are they playing with? We need to be aware of what our children are watching, what they're seeing and what they're playing with. Because if it's these video games and things like that, because you know what this video game teaches? Two things. It teaches your child how to take revenge, and it teaches the player how to kill. So now, let's imagine a 10-year-old playing this video game. What's he learning? What is the message that he or she is getting through the video game? Number one, that there is such a thing as magic and that it works. Number two, if someone does something to you, you do it to them. In Satanism, in the Satanic Bible written by Anton Zandor LaVey, one of the golden rules in there, one of the, one of the nine Satanic golden rules in there, says this. Do unto others before they do it unto you. And so this is what these games are teaching our children and our teenagers because these games are real popular with the teenage crowd. They go to the video stores and they pick up these games. Or they go to the arcade and they play them over and over and over again. Now, Sega has out for its Saturn system one called Nights into Dreams, and here's what the advertisement of that says. Listen to this. Nights brings you face-to-face -face both with your guiding spirits and your innermost demons. Well, praise God, that's what we all want. Final Fantasy IV, a game released in October 1996 for PlayStation, is com complicated because it's complemented by the authors of the Next Generation Game magazine. Here's what Next Generation Game says. 
says the setting for this game is marked Mak Makatashi, the city of bright magic, and one of the characters is a good witch named Aerith. Do you think it's by coincidence they're putting witches, vampires, demons, wizards, and everything else that they can think imaginable in these video games? Because I'm getting ready to now expose some screens to you that you're actually going to see some of those things in. This is, again, a game of revenge. Here is another picture of that. And if you really want to get into game secrets, they have, a, they have another uh, a game that you can actually buy, or a CD-ROM, excuse me, that you can actually buy that's game secrets. All these games contain secrets, in other, ways, uh, other words, things that uh, you can study and really get to where you can beat the system and win the game. And that's what these game secrets are. You look at this. This is the official game secrets, Legacy of Cain. And you see the picture on there is enough to give it away. That's Legacy of Cain. Now I'm going to show you a screen here. The next one is a screen from a game called Hexen. I want you to look at it. I'm going to ask you, what do you see? What do you see? Okay, pentagram, right? Right here. Does anybody see the blood around the pentagram? There's just been a human sacrifice. There is the symbol of the serpent. See it? Here's the circle. This is Stonehenge. These are the stones, and then there's a stone going across the pillars. This is Stonehenge. How many know that Stonehenge was a very sacred place to the Druids? That's where human and animal sacrifice took place. Hate to tell you, but it still goes on. Okay? These are Druids that are around there, stretching their arms. And now what you're doing is you're zeroing in, that's with that box, you're zeroing in on the Druids. And you're trying to keep them from catching you and sacrificing you before you can get to this, which is the treasure. And over here, these are druid gods. Those red that you see are their eyes. And again, I'm going to ask you, do you think they just came up with that game and said, hey, let's just throw that in there? It looks good. Let's just put that in the screen. Kids won't know what it is, but it looks good. It looks cool. We'll just throw that in. Next one is a screen from a video game called Doom. Now, remember we talked in the last session, we talked briefly about the Columbine murders. And we said that the, the, the video that had been released, the new information is that there's been a video released of the two boys actually sitting there and talking about the planning of how they were going to go about doing the Columbine murders in Colorado. And you know where they got the idea from? A video game called Doom. And the way that the Columbine murders were carried out is exactly the way that it was carried out in this video game. Exactly. To the T. Because in this new video that's, that's supposedly released, now I, I haven't seen the video myself, but I've talked to a couple of, of gentlemen who actually have seen the video or claim to have seen the video, and they said that one of the things they talked about on there was a video game that they played religiously day after day after day called Doom. And on the tape, they actually tell you that they repeat words over and over again. And one thing that they keep talking about all through this video, with the interview that they're doing, is doom. Doom. This is the video screen. Now, remember I told you that what happened is I take pictures from this one program and then put them into, uh, uh, take pictures of the screen of the computer. And then what I do is I get them off and then run them into an overhead. Now. This came up so fast that I didn't get a chance to get the second screen. In other words, my computer wouldn't take the picture that quick. But here's what happens. Here's what I want you to see. Here's the star right here. Did everybody see that red star? That's just a regular star. In other words, if it were to stand up, it would be a five-pointed star, but it would have the two points coming this way and one point up, like just a regular star. Okay. What happens is there's a creature or a form that comes out of the blackness here, there's a cave back there, comes out of the blackness towards you, you shoot it with your gun, and this star actually all of a sudden just 
jumps up and goes up to the next screen. Now, if it were to stand up, it would be a five-pointed star facing this way, but what actually happens is it actually backs up and the star raises this way, which makes it five-pointed star inverted, which is the universal symbol of all Satanist churches. And again, do you think they just put that in there by coincidence? Do you think someone just made the game and said, hey, let's just throw that in? We'd like that. Next screen is from a video game called Quake. Now, several things really interesting about this game. First of all, look what your counter goes to when you reach this screen. 666. Six, six. And you notice up here some writing, a message that you get on the screen, and it says, you got the pentagram of protection. Well, let's find out what that pentagram of protection is. Right here is a skull. And I, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there are horns actually going up and latching onto a bar up here. And this is the level. In other words, this is a, an opening that goes to the next level. If you can get past that, you're into the next level. So it's telling you, you've got the pentagram of protection for you to be able to get through there and go to the next level. What is the pentagram of protection? Well, there it is right there. The five-pointed inverted satanic star complete with the pentagram circle around it. Everybody see that? So that's the first level. And then if you get past that, and you're able to go with the pentagram of protection, you enter the next level. And here's the next level. And now look what we have. That's that star that was laying down. Now it's up here. And now you see the pentagram. The five-pointed inverted star. And this is real interesting down here because on this screen, it actually comes down and it shows you this. An N, an I, and a backward N. This is actually the spelling for an alternative metal band called Nine Inch Nails. And Nine Inch Nails has a lead singer named Trent Reznor. And Trent Reznor says that we represent the nine inch nails or we represent the nails that went into the hands and the feet of your God on the cross. And that's exactly what he says. In other words, we represent all that put Christ on the cross in a video game, on a screen. By coincidence? No. Because as you reach the level of this, not only do you see this, you also get to hear Nine Inch Nails do a song. And the song says, Terrible Lie. Now, I won't tell you all of it because I don't want to do it, even, even tell you what it is on, on camera because it's, it's vulgar. But at the last part, it says, He made up a God and called it Christianity. And then he says, Your God is dead and no one cares. This is on a video game called Quake. And these video games, remember, are available to practically anyone. Next video screen I'm going to show you is from a game called Duke Nukem. Duke Nukem is actually a cartoon character and actually has a comic book also. And Duke Nukem, this, this particular screen has nothing to do with the idea of Duke Nukem because Duke Nukem is a soldier. But this screen, somehow or another, got in the game. And I want you to see something here because it's very interesting. I want you to be able to see this. You're in a church in this particular screen. You're in a church. And I want you to see this. Right up here, here are the stained glass windows. Now, you can't see it real clearly, but if you look closely, you'll see an image that looks like Jesus on the cross. There are the thorns. Okay? on the stained glass window. Now, on the back of that wall is a cross. You see that? There it is, right there, and then it comes right here, and that's where the, the tips going across stop. It's a black cross. It's not doing anything. It's just on the wall. And right down here is an interesting piece because this is a gray screen, and if you look closely, it looks like what appears to be the Shroud of Turin. In other words, supposedly the face of Jesus that was 
uh, uh, supernaturally embedded in the cloth when he was wrapped up in the cloth and laid to rest in the, in the tomb. Everybody heard about the Shroud of Turin? And this is supposed to be the face of that. See, there's his face, eyes right here, and there's the hair. Beard here, and you can almost see the mouth. Now, an interesting thing happens. Follow along with me. An interesting thing happens. If you continue to touch any part of that gray screen, the screen changes. And from this screen, it goes red to this screen. And look what happens to the cross. It inverts. Now the cross is upside down. And over here is broken. The stained glass windows break. And down here, the shroud of Turin, or what once looked like the face of Jesus, is very contorted. And again, do you think they just put that on there by coincidence? Did somebody just come up with it and said, hey, let's just throw that in there? You have to really ask yourself, do they know what they're doing? What's the purpose behind what they're putting in these videos? Remember that the, that the New Age, what they want to call the New Age philosophy is to teach our children through the use of symbol, symbology, symbols. What better symbol than an inverted cross? Remember, also in the last session, I showed you that as one of the occult symbols and told you that that was the highest form of blasphemy in Satanism because it means that Christ did literally nothing on the cross. One of the highest forms of blasphemy of Christianity. Those games are pretty bad. But I think, in my own opinion, this is the worst one. The reason I say that is this. I sent off for a copy of this to play it. Now, there's Resident Evil, Resident Evil 2, and Resident Evil 3 called the Nemesis. Resident Evil 2, in my opinion, is the worst one of all. There is even a faction of Christian parents, thank God, that are actually trying to go around with a petition to try to get this and other games like this taken off the market. Praise God for them. I mean, I'm all for it. I think that's what needs to happen. I think that the only way we're going to have any action is when Christians finally get up and take a stand and put their foot down and say, this isn't going to happen. This isn't going to go on. But I want to tell you about Resident Evil 2. Now, here's the premise of Resident Evil, the game. Follow with me. There's a virus that's been unleashed in the city. And this virus causes all people, as they die, no matter what way they die, or are killed, and no matter what way they're killed, to come back to life as a zombie. And I mean, it's graphic. And I mean, this screen on this thing is so high resolution that it looks real. And if you play this thing on a huge uh, television screen, one of those big, big screen TVs, it looks like you're right there. I mean, they have found a way to make animation look like it's real and almost 3D, like it could just come right out of the screen at you. And at one point, the characters were going about getting killed by car accidents, uh, being decapitated, all horrible kinds of ways. And no matter what way you're killed or you die, you come back as a zombie, a flesh-eating zombie. And your whole goal through this video game is to survive zombie attacks. And you go around in the city and you go through all the, the streets and everything. And you have a gun. You have to shoot them in the head in order to get through. And I mean, when the zombies attack, parents, this thing is graphic. And you see body parts and you see blood. You see gore. Not, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything to you. I know we got kids in the audience. And I'm not going to sugarcoat anything to you, kids, because this stuff is out there. I mean, it's out there. And it's in plain sight. And this stuff is gory. And I'm going to tell you something. At one point, you see zombies, about, oh, I think about 30 or 40 of them, coming up toward the screen. Now, what you're supposed to do is shoot them to get out of there. But what I did was actually, I wanted to see what happened. And so I, what I did, I let off the controls. 
I, just, I didn't do anything. I just let off the controls and let the zombies get close to the screen. And I mean, the closer they get, the more real they look. And you see their mouths open up, and you hear them growling at you. You see that evil in their eyes. And they get up to the screen. You know what? If you let off the controls, you actually see them attack you, and you actually, in 3D, see your skin being ripped off on the screen. It's that bad. It's that bad. Again, like I said, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. If I were to sit here and go, oh, there's really nothing really wrong with that, or it's just a little bit bad, I'd be lying to you. I'm through with lying. I want to tell the truth, and I want, I want God's people to know the truth and what, what's behind all this. Here's one of the screens. Look at this. Isn't that pretty? This is one of the zombies right here. There you are with your gun. Now, I'm telling you, the graphics in this, this was just a screen, but the graphics actually like this, I mean, it looks like the hands are actually reaching out to you. And it looks real. I mean, with the, they, I'm going to tell you something. If, unless you've played the high-tech video games now, you don't know what they're able to do with these things. And they can make it look like you're right there in the picture. That's how high technology video has become. Oh, this is good. This is the newest video game out right now, and it's called Temple of the Master. Wonder why. This is a 3D video game, and what you do is you're, you actually maneuver your character through mazes, and you see a black castle, and you actually maneuver your character through all these mazes and out through all these rooms. And you, you're, you have to get through these rooms, and sometimes you'll get lost in total blackness. I mean, you'll get into a room, and it'll be total dark, and then you forget where you are, and you just stay there the rest of the game. I mean, that's, that's the way it is. But if you maneuver through enough of that, you get around to a room, and this is actually the throne room. And the whole goal is to get to the throne room. And so what you do is you actually maneuver your character throughout this, this castle of mazes, and look. Before you get to the throne room, look at this. Everybody see the levitating demons? There's their tail, there's their wings. And when you get in here, you have to pass through that. They attack you. So you have to survive a demonic attack. And so when you pass that, if you can get through these, you get to the throne room, and look who's in the throne room. Temple of the Master. That's the newest video game. And it's 3D. I mean, it's 3D. It looks real. And I mean, it looks like you're right there in the room itself. They, they're able to do that now with all that high technology and video. And now look behind there, and you look at that room, and you can see very clearly the symbol of Baphomet, complete with the Enochian keys around it. Now I'm going to tell you something. Unless you're a Satanist, people don't just put that in things because they wouldn't know what it meant. In other words, if I were just to put that in there and say, well, I just saw that in a book somewhere, I would probably put this, just this, the inverted star back there, but I wouldn't know what those Enochian keys meant because I hadn't seen the Satanic Bible. The people that made this game absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, know what these symbols mean, and that's why they put them in there, and it's called Temple of the Master, <laughs> their master. And now, we even have the toy manufacturers getting in behind it. Look at this. These are toys from the video game Resident Evil. Look here. These are two zombies right here. Here's one here. He's holding an arm, probably the arm of this guy. Well, that'd be arm robbery. Oh, Oh, God forgive me. Oh, frivolous spirit. Frivolous spirit again. Okay. There's the zombie here, and look at this. You actually see the chest open up and everything like that. Wouldn't that be nice for your five, six, ten-year-old to have and play with, those characters? You know, you laugh, but you know what? I went in the toy store. In fact, I'll tell you uh, the truth. I went in toy stores in ten different cities looking for these particular toys because I wanted to have one on tour to show you 
Guess what? There weren't any there. They're sold out. Kids either go in and buy them up, or collectors go in and buy them up. And you look at this thing and you go, whoa, wait a minute. How come I can't find this stuff? Because it's that popular. Because children want those toys so bad. And you can imagine what kind of nightmares your child must have playing with something like this. I mean, I don't think you can play Army Man or G.I. Joe or anything with these things. I mean, what could you do? What, what, I mean, you'd have, all you could do is act out what you just got through seeing on the video game. Amen? I mean, there's nothing else you could play with them for. What could you use them for? I'm going to play doctor. These are going to be my patients. Look, they've already been operated on. <laughs> you know, things like that. Toy manufacturers now starting to get behind the video games. Now, some interesting things. I'm going to share with you right here, and we're just going to hope that the cameraman can follow along with it. I'm just going to set it in front. Here's one called Digimon. I'll just hold it there. Here's one called Digimon. Now, you look at this toy, and you think, what is the difference between Digimon and Pokemon? And the answer is, absolutely nothing. The story is the same. They are monsters that can evolve and grow into bigger and better monsters. The only difference is, instead of using energy balls, they use that little uh, yellow orange device called a Digivice. These are kids that are on an island, and these monsters, these Digimonsters, that's what it stands for, digital monsters, are on an island with them. And these Digimonsters, at times, attack the children. And what, to fight them off, they use a Digivice. See, if you start talking like that, pretty soon your mouth's going to get all tangled up. Digivice, Digimon, <laughs> things like that. So it's like you look at those things, and there's nothing absolutely, absolutely nothing different in the, in the premise of this than there is Pokemon. The same company doesn't put it out, but you know what? They've jumped on it. Pokemon was so popular, now we'll come out with Digimon. But again, it's an oriental idea. For years, for hundreds of thousands of years, since time began, one of man's biggest beliefs was that he could bring out the animal nature in himself. Even to the point of actually, maybe, finding a way to become an animal. Well, praise God, someone found a way to do that. And it comes actually from an occult practice called lycanthropy. And that's where you get the werewolf, being able to transform from a human into animal form and then back to human. Well, now your teenage crowd has their heroes, and they're called animorphs. Let me see if I can get a little... There we go. Animorphs. And if you look at that, in this particular, this particular case, this is a teenager that can transform himself into a tiger. And it says on the back of the box, the invasion has begun. And then it also says, we call ourselves Animorphs. We can't tell you who we are or where we live. It's too risky. But it tells you that there are aliens that have evaded the earth and that the only hope for earth's struggle against these things are these teenagers who can transform themselves into animals. And so now, wouldn't that be real appealing to a child who goes around growling all the time anyway and acting like he's a dog or a cat or, you know, whatever, and now they go, man, wouldn't that be fun to be able to transform yourself into an animal? Wouldn't that be fun to become Bowser for a day and then back? Animorphs. Here's a cute one. If you can get a shot of that. That's a cute one right there. That actually transforms itself from a good animorph to an evil animorph. Now, I don't know. Again, 
You know, I, I, look, I look out in the audience, and, and we, we have a lot of children, and, but we have a lot of uh, uh, probably, oh, I'd say probably in the 30s, 40s, uh, even 20s uh, audience also. I don't know, going back even, even to what you were playing with, but we had like G.I. Joe, and, you know, we had planes, and Superman, and Batman, and I mean, our, our, our hero characters were more the heroes. I don't know what you call these things. Uh, they're definitely not heroes. And I've never seen anything that they're now coming out making it look so ugly. Look at that. That thing looks like something we used to pray to outside the circle. Looks like a demon. Remember that I told you that demons can appear to you in any way, shape, or form that makes you the most feared. <laughs> Guess what little Billy or Bobby are going to dream about when they get through playing with that before they go to bed. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And I'm going to show you the most atrocious of all. And I, I tell you something. If you don't believe that your kids like these things, see the tape on this box? <laughs> I didn't know whether these things were going to survive the tour enough to get here for the video shoot. I really didn't. The, the reason that's torn like that is because there were kids up there trying to get to it. They were wanting to get it out of the box and play with it. Look at that. Get a shot of that? Look at that. And I mean, if you want to see it closer, I'll show it to you closer later on. But you need to see this thing. These things are designed for your ages five and up. Five and up. And if you look down here on the bottom here, you'll see what looks to be an onk. And it's a satanic onk. Because now you have the cross, and the loop is not a loop. The loop is a skull. And on the skull, it actually, in the, in the forehead, has another satanic symbol. And you look on here, and I'm going to read to you what it says here on the back. Hopefully this thing stays together. This is called Tormentor. And it says, a strange brute, a savage brute with no soul, he lives to inflict torment, pain, and terror on others. His pleasure comes from the pain of others. He's a master of torture and the many instruments used to amplify pain and suffering. One of his most cruel acts was grafting the head and body parts of his victims to his own body as to be able to make his, their pain everlasting. And this is a toy for, 30, for, for five and up. A toy. You see that they have found a way to make evil look cute and get it into the homes of even our Christian kids. And I tell you, I mean, even if, you're, even if your kids don't bring this stuff home, I guarantee you they know somebody that's got it. Even if they don't have Pokemon, I can guarantee you that they know uh, many other kids that do. And if they're not playing these video games, I'll bet you they go over to the house of people that are, kids that are. And you have to wonder what kind of influence it's having on them when they come back into our homes. And I'm going to tell you something else. You, you need to be aware of what they might bring and end the door with them when they come back to your home. Because spirits can transfer. And if these things are actually, remember we said that one thing that these things do is they attract demons like a magnet? Then guess what your child has with him dragging in when he opens up the door after he's been subject to this thing, to these toys, to these video games, to these books? Guess what he's bringing in the front door with him when he comes back in your home? Demons. And those things are now in your home. Another toy is one of the, the ones that we look at that are kind of innocent looking. And everybody goes, oh no, not Furby. Not Furby. Not innocent, cute little Furby. Yep. Let me tell you a story. And it's a true story that happened to me because I happened to be a big part of it. I went to the Prophecy Club one morning to, uh, to talk to my wife. My wife, by the way, my beautiful, adoring, sweet, loving wife. See, I, I had to say that on tape. I can't tell you why I had to say that, but I did. And, and I, I went to see her and talk to her. She's the business office manager for the Prophecy Club. And I went to talk to her about something, and I went through the door, and one of the girls met me and she, right at the door, and she said, you've got to go upstairs. And I said, I mean, and she was just real, you know, adamant about it. You've got to get upstairs. And I said, what? And she goes, there's a Furby up there. Oh, God forbid. You know, I'm Furby. You know, I said, what, what? 
She goes, oh, you got to go up there and talk to Joanne. So you got to go up there and see what happened. Went up there, and, and my wife was sitting there at the computer and typing in orders and things. And I looked at her, and I said, what in the world is going on? I noticed there was one of the Furbies were sitting right there on, on, her, on her desk. And she said that there's a, there's a couple there that work there. Uh, they're getting ready to get married and young couple, and he had given her a Furby for her birthday. Now, she began to tell me a story about this Furby. She had put this Furby on her dresser, and one time at night, the Furby actually started speaking and waking her up. And it said, me want you. Now, you need to understand that this is the only toy created that actually has its own language. And they tell us that there is a almost human computer chip and by the way there is a computer chip right now getting ready to be released called the angel chip that is supposed to be able to even be implanted into human bodies because it actually can take the place of an organs functions a computer chip you'll hear you'll be hearing more about that later but they have a computer chip inside of them that allows them to develop language. And you're also told that these Furbies not only have their own language, but they can learn your language. And the more you talk to them, the more they pick up words from you. And they have language that they identify with each other and that this is the only toy on the market that can communicate with each other. And you know what? They can do that miles away. They have tested it. The toy manufacturers have run a big test on it, and it works. And they hear each other miles away, and they can communicate back and forth with each other from miles away. Only toy on the market that can do that. Now, going back to the story, young couple had been given the Furby. She got woke up in the middle of the night because the Furby was actually talking. Put the Furby down on the floor pass by it, and there's supposed to be a uh, computer analog right here. That's what this is here, that black design right in the middle of their forehead. Isn't that interesting? Okay, right in the middle of their forehead, and this is supposed to be the sensor, and it, it detects movement and also detects sound, and that's what is supposed to trigger off the chip in order for this to be able to talk, and its eyes move up and down. Now, put it on the floor and didn't want, it, didn't want it anymore, didn't want to talk to it anymore, and for days passed by it and nothing happened. And then one time it was on, a, a, on the desk again and said, me want your body. Then she said, no, I don't want this thing anymore, I gave it back to her boyfriend. Now, the boyfriend and the girlfriend had it in the car, were on the way to the Prophecy Club to take it over there, a car came out of nowhere, broadsided them from the side, and, and didn't hurt them, praise God, but, you know, blindsided the car, so the car is enabled. Took it back to the Prophecy Club and left it there. It was downstairs in the mail room, and that's, that's where the guys downstairs in the mail room at the Prophecy Club are busy filling out all, everybody's orders and things. And they had it sitting there, and one of the mail guys got upset with it because turned around and said it felt like that something was watching it from behind, watching him from behind took it upstairs and it ended up on my wife's desk and she looked at me and I'm gonna tell you something my wife is a born-again spirit-filled Bible believing God's uh, word reading Christian I mean she is on fire for the Lord and she does not tell things if they're not true and she told me what happened the Furby was sitting on her on her desk and she took the batteries out of this Furby because the Furby started talking she didn't like what it said. It said, me no like you. And she said, well, I don't like you either, and started to take the batteries out of it. <laughs> so she took the batteries out of it, and it growled at her. And she said, it growled. And I said, you mean it just made a growling noise? She said, no, it growled. I said, let me see that thing. And I picked that Furby up, and I sat down in a chair. And for about five minutes, all I did was try to commune with God and try to and, and, and ask the Lord. I said, Lord, show me what's in this. Show me what's behind all this. Is this, is this just a toy? And all of a sudden I said, and, and I, you know, 
it, you just have to take that spiritual authority over these things, you know. And I sat there and I said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I said, I know who you are. I know what you are. I said, reveal yourself now. And Furby opened up its eyes and said, me no like you. And I said, well, I don't like you either. You're out of here. In the name of Jesus, leave. And the beak shut, the eyes shut. Now, it said this without any batteries in the toy. No power. No electronic power. No ACDC, you know, power going to it. This thing spoke without power to it. And spoke out, and when it said, me no like you, <laughs> I don't care. You're out of here. In the name of Jesus, you're out of here. So it left, the beak shut, the eye shut, didn't talk again. I gave it back to the young couple and I said, because that was given to you, you now must be the one to destroy that thing. I can destroy it for you, but you need to take authority and break that curse. And so they took it out and they burned it. Now, she came to me, the young girl came to me at church about, I think it was about almost a week later, and she said that, the Lord led her to a book on Celtic deities and gods. And that the Furby, have you ever noticed when you go out to buy a Furby, these things have already names assigned to them? In other words, if you go out on the market right now and you go to look at a Furby, they already have a name given to them, uh, such as Tukala is one of them. Uh, hers was called Mimi, M-I-E-M-I-E. -M -I -E. And she said that Mimi really stuck in her head, and, she, and the Lord led her to this book on Celtic deities and gods from the library, and she looked it up, and Mimi was in there. And it described what Mimi was. Mimi was a giant that sat under a tree whose branches reached to heaven and roots reached to hell, and that this giant ruled over a land of dwarfs that were evil and did mischievous things. And I started thinking... Wow, I wonder if the other names have anything to do with it. So I started going out to the store, and I went to, to toy stores and looking for, for Furbies. And I was looking at the names of all of them and writing them down in a little book so that I could go back and try to, try to see some of them. And some of them just kind of hit something in my mind. And I thought, I've heard that name somewhere before. That name's real familiar. Where have I heard that before? And I went and I, I looked up, I went into the, to the website that, that's, uh, it's not a Christian website, but it's, it's another website that actually lists names of demons in hierarchy. In other words, it's a book of demons. I found 10 of them in that, in that book of demons. 10 of those names, of those Furbies. 13 of them I went and found in a book on Celtic gods and deities. My opinion, and it's just my opinion, but I believe this is what the Lord has shown me, that these innocent, cute little things are vehicles for demonic entities. You know, like if you have a car and you drive a Chevy and you go out tonight in the, in the parking lot, you don't look for a Dodge, you don't look for a Plymouth or something, you know, you, you look for that particular Chevrolet, right? That, that because that's your car, that's what's been assigned to you, that's what you bought and that's what you drive and so therefore that's your vehicle. Same thing with these things. These demons have that name assigned to that toy, so therefore, that's their vehicle. What better way to get in your homes than you bring those things in your home? And the thing about it is, when you start looking at those things, what do they look like? What do you, what, when you saw Furby, what did it remind you of? Okay, Ewoks? Gremlins. And what happened to gremlins when you poured water on them? They turned into what? Demons. Not evil other gremlins. The gremlins became demons. And so that's what these things have done. And I started looking at that and I said, man, that almost looks like a takeoff of gizmo. And now, praise God, they have a gizmo Furby out. And on the box, it's, it's for $29.99. For $29.99, you can have Gizmo in your home. And it says that he can communicate with Furbies and baby Furbies. And you wonder what they're saying to each other. Here is an experiment that they did. Now, this, this was taken off of a kind of, the, the picture was kind of blurry, but I wanted to get it on. I hope you can kind of see that. The picture itself was blurry. It wasn't, it's, not, it's not the overhead itself. 
But if you look at this now, there's a Furby, and this is a guinea pig, a big guinea pig. <laughs> that was funny, why? Okay. Now, what they did was they actually put this Furby in with the guinea pig to see how fast that would develop its language. 20 seconds was all it took for that Furby to be able to imitate everything that that guinea pig did. You ever seen a guinea pig or you ever had a guinea pig? What they do is they whistle and that's how they communicate. This thing started whistling the same thing that that guinea pig did in 20 seconds. That's not normal for any toy to be able to do that. Okay, enough on Furby. Show you some of the ones that are out on the market. Here's one from the popular movie, and we talked a little bit about it the first session, in fact. Halloween. Remember the story of Michael Myers? This is Michael. And now you can go out and buy your hero slasher and take it home and play with it. And wouldn't you want your nice five and six-year-old son or daughter to bring this through the door of your home and start playing with it? Because this can kill G.I. Joes and everything else, and the G.I. Joes can't kill it. Okay? All your little army men going against it, it can't, remember, you can't be killed. Here's another picture of him. And you see, there he is with the overalls, there he is with the mask, and there he is, and this is a toy. This is an action figure. Action figure. And we talked about this one. Scream. Here he is, the maniacal killer from Scream. Complete with the Halloween costume and the mask. And it, you can't see it, but right there is the cell phone. And he's even got a little dagger with him. And these are designed for five years and up. Right there on the box. Here's a clear. Look at that. There he is with the knife. There he is with the mask, costume, scream. There's the cell phone. How many remember Sleepy Hollow? Legend of Sleepy Hollow? Here's a nice toy. Action figure Sleepy Hollow, complete with no head. But he's carrying heads. There's the axe, even got blood on the axe. These are for our kids to play with. You imagine what they're going to do with them. Or you can get the Sleepy Hollow Deluxe, complete with the head, which is not much better looking. There's the axe, there's, there's his head, he's supposed to, that is supposed to go on there, and here's two heads down here that he's supposed to be carrying. And wouldn't that be nice for grandpa or grandma to walk in and see your son or daughter playing with that on the floor? About that time, they would start opening up the Word of God and really preaching to you. Here's another character. This is necromancy from, from the movie. There's the eyes bulging out. You see the serpents. They actually turn into serpents. This, this is a toy. This is a toy. Here it is in all her splendor. Again, you see the candle down here. These are potions right in here. A skull, and that's a goat's head skull, by the way. You see how she's kind of losing her flesh. But you see how it makes it appealing? Look at that leg coming out of there. Looks like a lady's human leg. But then you see her face. There's no way in the world you'd kiss her. Here again from Spawn. Look at this. Two snap-on mask and hook veil. And look, there's the onk again. And 
this lady is really evil looking. In fact, you even get a nice dragon along with it and a couple of heads that she's gotten. And again, designed for young children. How many remember Ozzy Osbourne from Black Sabbath? You know, the, the guy that's supposed to, that everybody says, oh, Ozzy's got everybody beat, uh, fooled, because he's really a good family man and he's a, a, actually a Christian. Mm -hmm. Look here. Here's Ozzy, complete stage presence. And this is a toy. And these down here, brothers and sisters, are doves with their heads bitten off because Ozzy had a stage show in which he would take doves, live doves, and bite the heads off of them on stage. What's the dove a symbol of? The Holy Spirit. What's Ozzy saying? Exactly. Here's another view of that. So now you can have your favorite rock star complete with his satanic presence and have it as a toy. And again, what's really strange about this is that you can't find these things in toy stores because they're sold out. Kids are going in and buying them up. And one of the latest ones is out. It hasn't even been released yet. It's supposed to be released in, uh, in January, but I got a preview of it. This is one of the most infamous rock and rollers of all time and one of the most popular with the young crowd. He's called Rob Zombie. And here he is, complete with his background, and this is a toy. This is a toy. See the skulls around the bottom there? These are all toys designed for our children. And again, I have to ask you, do you think these things are all done by coincidence? There's no way in the world that somebody just came up with this and said, oh yeah, let's just throw that in there. Or let's just create this because it looks cool. That doesn't look cool. The only people it's going to uh, appeal to are the ones that are in, living in darkness. I mean, that's just a simple fact. One of the things that, that lure people into the occult, the lesser side of the occult, or what we call lesser magic, one of those devices is called astrology. And what astrology says is this. Now in the times of iniquity, you need to understand where astrology actually came from. Astrology came from the time of iniquity. In fact, it was introduced into history in the time of Nimrod. Now there were actual forms of astrology because at some point in time in history, man began to look up and, and see the stars and thought that those were actual beings. But in the time of iniquity, in other words, the time of Babylonian uh, existence and the time of Nimrod, Nimrod is actually the one that introduced it into history because he made it a prerequisite for the city of Babylon. And what it says is basically this. They started to look up into the stars at night and in the heavens, they started to see that these stars started to form shapes. And those shapes were shapes of either beings or animals. And they started looking at these things as being gods. And they believed that these things were actually living beings and that the heavens were their houses. And so what they did is they formed a, a, a system that said this, if your child or if you were a child that was born in a particular month, on a particular day, at a particular time of that month, that that particular God was prevalent, in other words, that was the sign that was seen the most clearest in the heavens, that your character, your personality, your very destiny was ruled by that particular God. And that this happened every time that the sun circled the earth. Now what's wrong with that premise? Sun doesn't circle the earth. Earth circles the sun. 
The whole thing was based on a fallacy. They had it backwards. But let me give you an example of how astrology works and how, how people are kept in bondage with this. Let's take a for instance. Okay, here's a man who gets up in the morning and he reads his horoscope. Okay, and the horoscope says, you are not to go behind any green doors today. Stay away from green doors. So he looks at that and he says, well, I work at a parts store. Uh, there's no green doors at the parts store, so I'm okay. I'll go to work. And he goes to work. Gets there and the boss says, oh, Joe, would you go across town over there, that new parts store, and pick up that new part and bring it back? He says, okay. He drives over there, a brand new parts store, and he's whistling all the way, you know, because he knows he's just fine today, doesn't have anything to worry about. And he gets over there, and he walks in the door, and he's all happy, and he says, well, I'm about off of work anyway. You know, I'll just pick up that part, take it home, and I'll be done. You know, take it back to the store, and I'll be done. And he gets in there, and he, he says, hi, I'm Joe from the other parts store, you know, and uh, I came over to pick up that part. And he says, yep. He said, you can go over and pick it up right over there. I'm too busy, but you can go over there and get it. He says, where is it? He said, over there behind that green door. Now, first thing that happens is he starts to remember what he just read that morning. He goes, oh, my God, a green door. What's going to happen? Now, as he gets, steps behind that green door, that green door, this is a new building, so now maybe that green door is off its hinges just a little bit. And now the, the people who are cleaning the building have stocked pails and bops and brooms and everything else behind that door. So the first thing that happens is when he opens up that door, that loose door hits him in the head. And that isn't enough. He stumbles a little bit and he starts going in there. And as soon as he gets into the door, all the brooms and everything come toppling over on him. Now he just knew that happened because he'd read it in his horoscope not to go behind green door. He knew if he'd stayed behind that, you know, away from that green door, that stuff never would have happened. Now just because of that little incident, what's going to happen from the next morning on, he's going to do exactly what that horoscope says because now he's trapped. Now he's in bondage to that thing because it believes, he believes that it controls his destiny every single day of his life. And now he's in bondage to it. Horoscopes, astrology. Every, everybody looking for something. Everybody's looking for something to, to, to be the, the true way. You know, and Satan does everything he can to put everything else in your way other than the true vision or the true light, which is Jesus Christ. He'll throw everything else in your way and say, hey, follow this, follow that. You want to get to God? You get to God through this. Let's play a Ouija board. So let's talk about Ouija board. I would tend to imagine that the average home, surely not the Christian home, has at least one of these in it. This is from the Museum of Ouija Boards, and actually, this is one of the very first ones. And the way that this whole thing came about is there were two sisters in New England, the Fox sisters, and they actually introduced spiritism to the United States. And the reason that happened is that the Fox sisters began to develop an uncanny way of communicating with spirits of the dead. And the first thing they did was come up with a device called table wrapping. Have you ever heard of that? Table wrapping is a way in which they communicate with the spirits. And what you do is you ask the spirit a question. And the table, if it's a yes, one end of the table will rise up and then come down and, and bump the floor. And if it's a no, the other end of the table, the person sitting on the end of the, end of the table with their hands on top of the table, that table will rise up and thump the floor for no. And that got to be real noisy. And so what they did is they had to come up with something that was a little bit more quieter, but that they could still contact the spirits with. And so what they came up with was the Ouija. And we, in French, meaning yes, and ja, in German, meaning yes also. And you notice now, that at the top of this thing is yes and no. And you notice also that you start seeing some symbols on there. Look at there. There's the crescent moon and the star. Over here, a full moon. 
Down in here is a frog. Over on this side, you'll see a witch and a black cat. And down here, it's, you have your numbers, one through zero, and then the alphabet, A through Z. Now, what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to contact the spirit of the dead person, and through the use of what the device called the planchet, and that's this harp-shaped device here. Through the use of the planchet, you're supposed to put your fingers on top of this, and then it has this window here, and you're asking the spirit a question, and then the spirit is supposed to actually move. You're not, you don't move your fingertips at all. What's supposed to happen is the spirit's supposed to actually move the planchet one way or another and over either a letter or a number, and then you look through this, yellow, this, this window here to actually see what it's spelling out. These are all from, from Museum of Ouija Board. These are very, very old. This, this Ouija Board dates way, way back. I mean, this is not anything that's new. They've had it for, for years. In fact, in 1848, actually, is when the first Ouija Board came out. And they've developed different ones throughout the years. This one's called Witch Board. And there was even a movie produced on this particular board called Witch Board. And then there was a Witch Board 2 and Witch Board 3. And in that, there were actually contacts with demon spirits, and the demon spirit ended up doing possession. Now you notice that on this one, they have put 1 through 0, yes and no, there's your alphabet, and now a hello and goodbye. I guess they want the spirit to know it's welcome here and then make sure that it's gone when it's gone. Okay? And it looks very innocent. How many people saw The Exorcist? Okay. Uh, when I talk to a lot of people that see The Exorcist, they, they can remember the movie, but they can't remember this one particular scene. If you were to watch The Exorcist again, you'd actually see this one scene. The mother now is, is a worker on a, a production company, a film crew, and she doesn't have time to spend with her young daughter, Reagan, played by Linda Blair, and in this one scene, she goes downstairs, and Linda Blair, Reagan, has pulled out a Ouija board. And she has it sitting there, and Mom says, what is that? And she said, it's a Ouija board. And she goes, what do you do with it? She says, I play with Captain Howdy. And she says, who's Captain Howdy? She says, that's my friend. He contacts me on the Ouija board. Well, what does he do? He hides things. He, he, he plays with me. He hides things in my room takes things from one place and puts them in another so I can't find them. And, and mom, of course, looks at her and says, oh, okay, like, you know, well, my daughter has an imaginary friend. I guess that's better than having no friends at all. Well, what happens is that now, all of a sudden, bigger things start moving around the room. Reagan's personality starts to change. Other things begin to change. Mom can't figure out what's going on. And now, all of a sudden, Reagan levitates up off her bed and now becomes demon-possessed. A Ouija board is not a game. It is direct communication with demonic entities. And they will work with you up to a point, to the point to where they get so intimate with you that the next step is actual possession of your body. These are just a few of the Ouija boards that are out. I'm just going to show you just a few of them. Here's one somebody made out of uh, just wood, just cut a tree down and, and made one out of that. It's amazing what they'll do with them. Here's one of the newest ones. Look at this. You don't see occult symbols in there. Look at that. Look at there. There's a symbol of your triple goddess even on the Ouija board. Look at that. There's the pentagram. The yin and yang. Someone asked me about the yin and yang. That's a symbol. It's, it's an occultic symbol. It's also an a oriental symbol. It means light and darkness, good and bad. Uh, it means that life continues on and on they, because in the Orient they believe in reincarnation. Uh, here's your stars. Your star up here, crescent moon and stars. Another pentagram over here with satanic uh, symbols in it. And you'll see here, there's your stars, and it's even in from here. And now it's A through Z, 
to, actually, this is just covered up because the, the planchet comes right down in here. See that? So it's still one, one through zero, and then goodbye. But these are things that they're coming up with now. Now, Parker Brothers picked that up and said, we're going to make an exciting game out of it. And so I want you to know that the Ouija board outsells Monopoly, which is one of the most popular games, 10 to 1. And if you look on the box, you know where the manufacturing company is? Salem, Massachusetts. Huh, isn't that a coincidence? Now, this is the newest. It's called the All-Seeing Eye Oracle. Huh. And the first thing you notice is the hexagram. Right in the middle, complete with the all-seeing eye. And now we have yes and no, and yes and no. And now the spirits, and just in case they're not sure, there's a maybe, or, well, I really don't know. <laughs> so I guess when you pass over into the afterlife, or the never-never the, the, the world, where you're supposed to be roaming around as a spirit, you don't really know everything. Okay? So when you communicate back with someone, I guess you just really don't know everything. And it goes all the way around, and you see how it's in a circle. And that's not a coincidence. That's the newest Ouija board put out. And now, praise God, you can even get a Ouija board put out by Parker Brothers that glows in the dark. Look at that. So now, if it's not good enough, as if it weren't bad enough to play this thing in the daylight, now you can expose this thing to light during the day, get with your friends at night, turn off all the, all the lights, and then ask the spirits to communicate in pitch darkness. Isn't that wonderful? And have you ever seen the advertisements for these things? I mean, it, it, they're done by kids. There's kids playing them. In fact, you can even contact angels. There's a Ouija board for angels. Look at this. Angel board. You know, that now I guess they know everything because there's no maybes over here in a question mark. But you can even contact angels in that special. You see how subtle that is? And I've been in a Christian homes, I'm talking Christian homes, where I walk in there and the Lord will be, be speaking and revealing something and says, something's just not right here. I said, well, well, Lord, what is it? Show me what it is. Lead me over to a closet. What do you got in that closet? Oh, just some games. What do you got in the games? What, what, what kind of games you got? Oh, Monopoly and, you know, Risk and things like that. Can I see it? Sure. Open up the door, start looking through the games on the bottom of them. Ouija board. So, huh, how long have you had this? Oh, that was passed down by my great-grandmother. Guess what you also inherited from your great-grandmother? The spirits that were with her when she was contacting them. And you wonder why you start having things in your house. I said, anything going on in the house that's unusual? Well, yeah, now that you mention it, sometimes the phone will ring and I'll go to the phone and there won't be anybody on it. Okay, anything else? Yeah, um, I'll lay money on the desk and I'll go there to get it and it's gone. Do you ever find it? Yeah, it'll be in the living room, but I didn't go in the living room. <laughs> get rid of that Ouija board. <laughs> As soon as they do, praise God, it stops. I mean, the whole thing just stops. In 1970s, they came out with heavier and darker music. And one of the lures that get into our, ch our children today and our teens today is the music scene. And I'm telling you that some of these artists... You don't have to hear them backwards. What they say forwards is bad enough. Uh, one of the biggest ones is Marilyn Manson. <laughs> Somebody knows what I'm talking about. And I want to read to you something that Marilyn Manson said. Now, Marilyn Manson also was inducted in the Church of Satan by Anton Zandor LaVey as the position of reverend. And now he's referred to as Reverend Manson. 
And now I want to read to you what he has to say. And this is his own words. First of all, I'm going to read to you and tell you what he said to Spin Magazine. August 1996 on page 34. He says this. Hopefully I'll be remembered as the person who brought an end to Christianity. Also on the t-shirts that he sells at his concerts, you see things like Kill Your Parents and I Love Satan. And he claims that his album, the one that boosted him to superstardom, and is also entitled Antichrist Superstar, was given to him by, by supernatural inspiration. And he says this. He said, I heard this album is finished. I heard it in dreams. It was like the revelation of John the Baptist or something. He says, I think every time people hear this, this new album, maybe God will be destroyed in their heads. And then he goes on to say in Hit Parader, I don't know if anyone has really understood what we're trying to do. This isn't just about shock value. That's just there to lure the people in. Once we've got them, we can give them our message. You know what that message is? In 1970s, Satanist groups and groups that worship Lucifer as their god began to do a, an examination of music, and then they came up with a process called backward masking or back masking of music. What happens is they put the song on a 16-track master tape, then they go back and as they're putting it into the, the final editing and everything else, they electronically put a message over the top of that. Now, if you know that a group worships Satan, you know that if they say something forwards, when you play it backwards, you're going to hear a satanic message anyway. Okay? But it's real interesting to hear some of these messages that they put on there. I brought some of those messages tonight so you can hear some of the things that they've actually been able to do with this back masking. There's a process in the brain that psychologists tell you that if I tell you something that you know to be a truth, you will shut that out immediately. In other words, if you're a born-again Christian, I walk up to you and I say, Satan is God. The first thing you say is, no, he's not. That's not what I learned. That's, that's the truth that I believe is that Jesus is Lord and Satan is not God. But if I were to walk up to you and just say, Natas Sadrol, the first thing that happens is, you go, what was that? And what happens is that filter part of your mind starts letting that message in. So the subconscious now has let that message in. And what happens is that message now becomes a belief or an ideology and now enters into the soul system and corrupts the soul. And I'll show you how they do that. What we're going to do is going to play a song for you. The first one is by a group called Pink Floyd. And you'll hear them say, as, now, this is recorded forwards, and you'll hear them say gibberish, and then you'll hear the message as it's recorded backwards, okay? This is forward. Back. Now, what he said was, congratulations, you just found the secret, secret message. Send your reply back to, and then he started to give the address, and that cut off. Okay? Second one is by the Beatles. It's called Revolution Number 9. What you're going to hear, first of all, is just the man repeating over and over again, number 9, number 9, number 9. Now, remember that the Beatles are British, and when they say something, it's... It's told like in British, so you have to listen and listen for the for the for the uh, the dialect. Okay. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. You hear it? Number nine. 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 Did you hear Turn Me On Dead Man? Turn Me On Dead Man. 
Remember, they're talking in British dialect. Turn me on, dead man. Now, what that was was Paul McCartney, the bass player of the Beatles, at one time, they went and said that what they wanted to do was to actually kind of promote popularity of them by making them think that Paul was dead. And so Paul, to play along with it, decided what they're going to do is they're going to put a message on there saying that John Lennon was saying a secret message back saying that Paul was dead. So that's why he says, turn me on dead man. Now, these are done deliberately, okay? These are all put on there electronically. I'm not trying to, trying to sn snooker you into something else. They, these are all put on there electronically. There's only one song that we're going to hear tonight that was not done electronically. I believe it was put on there by evil spirits. Okay? The next one you're going to hear is by a group called Electric Light Orchestra from a song called Fire on High. Now, the first part you're going to hear is nothing but gibberish because if you were to take the record and play it forwards, that's all you hear is gibberish. In fact, you had to go and take the record and actually turn the turntable backwards in order for you to hear what they were actually saying. Forward. This is what you hear on the album. Backwards. The music is reversible, but time. Turn back. Turn back. Turn back. Turn back. Did you hear what he said? The music is reversible. Just they told you what they had done. It wasn't anything that they were trying to put across. They told you what they were done. In witchcraft, one of, the, one of the most infamous things that they did to show homage to Satan was because he was half man and half goat, supposedly, that's how they imaged him, was that they would come up and kiss his behind. That's how they got favoritism with Satan. And, then, and, and they renewed their powers with him each, each year at the equinox. Now what you're going to hear is Marilyn Manson. And listen for the words, Satan wants an ass kiss. Hear it? Hear it? Okay, so let's go forward. Now that's a group called Bone Stugs and Harmony, a rap group. And what he's saying is murder more, murder more, murder more mayhem. Okay? Um, let's go just a little bit further. Because I want to get to the, uh, the just of this thing. Teeth. Cease to 
Jesus. That would not be the, uh, the apocalypse. See that? He says that he thinks that mosh is just like what the Christians call the apocalypse. Mosh dancing is where the, the people get up, the, the youth get up, and they throw themselves against each other while they're dancing, and kind of basically it's a, it's a uh, crash course. I mean, it's like they crash into each other. Some on here that I can't, I can't even play for you because, I mean, even forward, they're, they're that bad. Let's go to uh, one of the more infamous ones. Everybody remember Queen? The group, rock group Queen, very popular in the uh, 70s, in fact. And they came out with uh, another song called Another One Bites the Dust. What we're going to do is we're going to listen to Another One Bites the Dust. And at that time, they were actually putting a message on top of that thing that people weren't getting, getting. And what happens is you actually, when you play it backwards, you hear what they're saying. What'd you hear? Yeah, fun to smoke marijuana, start to smoke marijuana. Forward. Everybody hear it? This is this is Hillary. Okay. Now we're going to get into the last one. And what you're going to hear is you're going to hear the infamous song. Stairway to Heaven, recorded by Led Zeppelin. And in this particular case, there was no electronic backmasking done. In fact, Led Zeppelin says, we don't know how that got on there. And so what happened was, this was the fastest right written song, rock and roll song. This actually was written in 30 minutes. Forward. If there's a button in your bedroom, don't be alone there. It's just been sprinkly for the make queen. Yes, there are two paths you can go back, but in the long run, there's still time to change the And what they're really saying. Here's to my sweet Satan. Here's to my sweet Satan. One who makes me glad, who makes me sad, whose power is Satan. If you will, he will give you 666. <laughs> He bought a little tool shed where he made us suffer, sad Satan. What they didn't know was, and even Jimmy Page, the one who spent multi-millions of dollars to buy Aleister Crowley's mansion, in fact, didn't know about that mansion was that it was nicknamed the tool shed because that's where Aleister Crowley took all of his initiates over and had them branded with 666 on their forehead to show homage to Satan. I hope that tonight you've been able to see through all this presentation, that there is a battle going on. I mean, we're in full-fledged spiritual warfare. And I know, I know what a lot of you are saying. How can I get this out of my child's life? I can't just walk in there and say, you know, I found a truth tonight that Pokemon and all that stuff is evil and it's out of the house. Don't do that. Because the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to run into big-time resistance. That thing's got a hold on them. If it didn't, they'd have been able to get rid of it a long time ago. What you do, you can go through all the characters, like I did with, with the Pokemon characters with you, and sit there. You know, if you ask your child, what, what, not what do you want to be when you grow up, but what do you want people to be able to say about you when you grow up? 
They're not going to sit there and go, well, I want to be an obnoxious jerk. You know, they all have good, good standards. Don't ever consider your child to be dumb. Never call your child dumb. They are more intelligent than we give them credit for. And you know what? They love to learn. And they love to have the truth told to them. And you know what? Once you reveal a truth to them, they can't wait to go and tell other kids. They love to talk. And they love to share information. I've seen where first graders have learned about Pokemon, taken another child and got rid of his Pokemon cards, and now, praise God, they've got a, a little evangelistic group of five other kids that are going around to first and third graders and getting them inducted into what Pokemon really is, revealing it to them. I've seen it happen. It works. And a lot of us are sitting going, well, I just don't know. There's so much rebellion in, in my family, and there's so much things going on. Praise God, I want to tell you something. A lot of us have been holding on to what's called generational witchcraft. A lot of us have things that we haven't been able to let go of, things that have been passed down, or things that you did back in the, in the old days that you never repented of. This is a safe place tonight. I want to ask you a question. How many, and be, be honest now, How many? because some of you need to get free tonight. Some of you need to get free tonight. God's been speaking to a lot of you tonight, revealing some things to you. How many here have ever played or, or, or have a Ouija board now? Had your horoscope read? Played with tarot cards? Any kind of fortune telling? How many have some of these things that we've been talking about these last two nights in their homes right now? Praise God. We need to shut the door on Satan because what happens is all you need is a crack. And if he can get a foot in, he can get a leg in. Once he gets a leg in, he got his whole self in there, and then you've got the occult right there in your living room. That's why it's called that. Let's go before the Lord and get rid of that. You know what? If you didn't raise your hand, pray with us anyway, because you know what? There's, there's power in number. Let's go before God. Would you repeat after me? Father in heaven, Lord, I just come to you tonight. In the name of your son, Jesus. Lord, right now, I repent of practicing those things that you have said are forbidden. And in Jesus' name, I break all generational curses and all curses associated with those objects. And I give the devil notice tonight that I shut the door on him, that he will not have my life my family, my marriage, my children, he will not have me. Father, I thank you now for your freedom and your deliverance and your breaking the bonds. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You know, a lot of us look for different things, and what we've been looking at a lot of us look for different ways to reach, reach the Lord. And we're going, a lot of us going through psychic things, and a lot of us going through ways of playing with demons, because that's what it's teaching us. Our children are being taught that they can make devils subject to them, that they can play with fallen angels, that they can become the master. There's only one master, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the only master that you should have in your life. And if those things are in your life, you need to get rid of them. God's been speaking to you tonight about some articles you've got in your home. All I can encourage you to do is be obedient. Be obedient. Go home and ask, Lord, what is in my home that I need to get rid of? And then take the authority. Take that authority and get rid of it. Cast it out of your life. You'll be blessed for it. Give God praise because, I mean, some of you got really delivered tonight. You got some chains broken. And you know, instead of fooling around with these things, instead of fooling around with these things, we need to be on our knees before the Almighty God.
right it is so very important that we be on our knees now as I look around up here and I see all of this evil things and the devil that he brings into people's lives I'm reminded of the scripture that says that he comes not but for to kill to steal and to destroy he comes into your home he comes into your world into your business into your family to steal and destroy but the good news is there is still a power greater than him that can come in and close the doors of the wicked one, that can refute and destroy the works of the devil. And we're going to pray in just a minute, and we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. We're going to pray to break some of those curses. You see, right after uh, Moses was given the Ten Commandments, he said that I'm setting before you a list of blessings and a list of cursings. If you follow my laws, there are blessings. If you don't follow them, there are cursings. And he says that I will curse you to your third and fourth generation. Another scripture, he says, I will curse you to ten generations. And many times we do things, even Paul says, that that I would do, I do not. And that that I don't want to do, that is what I do. And the reason is, is because Maybe we're controlled by the sins of our fathers and the sins of our forefathers and the fathers before them. And those blessings are coming down or their cursings are coming down. Matter of fact, I believe one of the reasons right now this nation, even though it has so much evil on it, continues to be blessed to this very moment anyway, is because the blessings of our forefathers. But those blessings are catching up and the curses are overtaking them. And we have to get the curses out of our life. We have to get the sin out of our life. We've got to get the leaven out of our life. So that's going to be part of the prayer tonight. Now, I realize that there's some people here in the audience that may not know Jesus. And there's certainly going to be some people who are going to be watching this videotape that may not know Jesus. So I'm going to give you the steps to do two things. One is how to get your name written in the book of life so that you can live eternally with Jesus. And two, how to get your heart cleaned so you can close those spiritual doors and so he can protect you in the day of trouble. So, first of all, we have to realize we're a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, we've all made mistakes. We've all messed up. And some of this stuff down here is some of the subtle ways we messed up. We didn't even know we were messing up, but we did. Ephesians 2.8.9 says, For it is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, 
It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So going to heaven is nothing we can earn. It's a gift. But we do have to take that gift. We have to reach out and take it. We can't just sit there and expect it to overtake us. We have to reach out and take it. How do we reach out and take it? Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, give us the answer. It says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believe in the righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In other words, it's, what it's saying is it's not enough to say it and not believe it. It's not enough to believe it and not say it. We've got to say it and we have to believe it. Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission or the washing away of your sins, the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But the first word in that, uh, in that scripture is repent. What does repent mean? It means we turn away from stuff like this. We get away from the filth. We turn our back on the old things. We turn our back on the filth. We walk away from it. And once we're washed, we do not return to the mud again. We get out of the ditch. We stay out of the ditch. Holy Spirit, I ask you to go out and knock on the hearts of the people in the audience and also on videotape. Those people whose names you'd like to write in the book of life, that they would not put it off, that they would make that decision tonight in Jesus' name. Let's all bow our heads. Also on video, no one looking around. Let's pray it together. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive my sins and the sins of my father and the forefathers before him. I ask you to break all curses. Release me from all demonic claims. Set me free. Write my name in the book of life. Keep me holy. Save me in the day of trouble. Because I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross so his blood could wash me clean. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that doeth the will of the Father. What's he saying? He's saying that he wants us to turn from sin. He wants us to acknowledge it before groups of people. Matthew 10:32 and 3 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will also confess my Father before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. He's simply saying, if you accept him as Lord and Savior, then you need to be willing to say it to other people. And this is just a first step. We need to have a little steel in our backbone and be willing to do that. Now, the next thing we're going to do is rededicate our lives. And that is, I believe that there's a lot of people in here that have said, Jesus come into my heart, but they never made a covenant, a promise to God that they were not going to sin anymore. In other words, they're not going to return to the ditch. What we're going to say is, uh, from this moment on, Lord, I'm going to ask you, with your help, to help me stay clean, to stay out of the ditch. No more sin. Does that mean we're perfect? No, but it means our objective is to live without sin. Now, if you'd like to be one of those people that makes a commitment, and there's going to be a two-part commitment. First commitment is to live without sin. The second commitment is that you're putting your application, so to speak. I'll use this, the application. You're putting application on the king's desk. You're saying, Lord, I want to go to work for you doesn't necessarily mean it's full time, but you're not going to limit what the Lord wants to do in your life. What you're saying is, I want you to use me to whatever degree that you've chosen to use me from the foundation of the world. To whatever you desire of me, what I'm saying is, I'm giving you my steering wheel. See, a lot of us still have the steering wheel to our life. We need to give the steering wheel to God. We need to say, you control my life. I'm willing to do what you tell me to do. Now, here's what we're going to do. If you want to make that commitment, that second commitment, saying, God, I want to go to work for you, and I make a promise that I'm not going to sin anymore. With your help, my objective in life is to live without sin. If you want to make that commitment, please stand. You're saying, I want to go to work for you, and I make a commitment before men and before God that from this moment on, I'm going to live without sin. With your help, I can't do it myself, but I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, 
I make a covenant before men and God to live without sin with your help. I now put my application on your desk and I ask you to put me to work to do those things you've desired me to do from the foundations of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.